Lou Sims. Welcome, my brother. I'm welcome to be here. So, quick bio. Let people have some foundation to understand where we're coming from, where we're we beginning here. So, you're the former leader of the infamous 142nd Street lynch mob. You were born in Harlem sometime during the mid latter 60s. You grew up smack dab in the middle of America's first opioid epidemic, surrounded by poverty, desperation, and violence. And the rest is a brutal history that we're here today to discuss. Right? Yeah. Okay. Welcome to Vlad TV. <laughs> All right. Before we really dig in, man, tell me, why is it that you sometimes come up in searches as Lou Sims and other times you come up as Lou Griffin? Oh, wait, that was like the, that was like the house, that was my mother made a name, so that was the house, that was the, like the household name that we used, everybody knew us for as in the street, but like well, every time I got arrested, I tried to use a different name from my father's name to my mother's name, and you know, so when I do get the call, when they get the call home, they'll know who exactly what I am, still using a John Doe name. Right, right. So Griffin was your pop's name. Right. Um, what was life like in your home as a child? Well, I, I grew up in the 60s, so you know, that was during a, during a time of poverty, you know what I'm saying? But I really never felt it, because I was like a baby at that time. So by the time I was like five or six, you know what I'm trying to say? It was, you know, I went from my mom's telling me, you know what I'm saying, asking my mom's for some for a cookie or something. She telling me to take one cookie because it was 10 of us. You know what I'm saying? So it was 10 of us. And then you got to remember, I got nephews. I got two nephews that we we run the same in the age. So for all the, for, all, for us to go in the refrigerator and get what we want, we wouldn't have no food. So she was like, take one cookie. But like when the 70s came, I remember like, now I can just go in there and I didn't have to ask. I can just go in and get what I want to get, you know, because like my brothers and my sisters was in the street then. You uh, know? Uh, so the, the, the thing, the, the drug thing came into your life before you early got outside. Life. Yeah, early in life. I always had a, a household name in my house from my brother Kate. You know what I'm saying? But like when I was when I started going to school, like from a public school to junior high school, it was kids in the school that was, you know, talking highly of him amongst other people. But, you know what I'm saying? It was like, yo, that's your brother. Yo, you know, he this, this. And, you know, he was always known as a fly dude, get money, you know. And he grew up the same way I grew up. Like, know everybody in Harlem from the Bronx. So, you know, you know, he had history. So that that just had to the, my, you know, when I went to the street, you know. How far did you go in school? 10th, 10th grade. From the 10th grade, I got locked up and went to state prison. Ah, uh, right. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, so, what would you locked up for? That that what was your first attempt beat? murder armed robbery? When did you first pick up a pistol? Oh man, I don't know. I, I remember uh, my back in the days, my brother and them. They used to him and uh him and this little crew, Tony Christian, uh, Bang, uh, Willie Martin, and all them. They used to do robberies, but they ain't never rob. They never did robberies like rob the next man on the street. They always did, you know what I'm saying, stores and stuff like that. So I remember them coming home and, you know, I remember coming home from school seeing a bunch of money on there. And then I remember my brother Kite, he used to come home, take all the bullets out the gun. And uh, he used to take showers as he changed his clothes. And I used to play with the gun on the bed, you know. Back then it was revolvers though, you know. So I, I, I was familiar with those back when I was a kid, you know what I'm saying, just seeing him, you know, playing with his money and his, and his cause I was little. You know what I'm saying? So I was idolized about, you know what I'm saying, certain things like that. How, about how old were you when you say little? I'd say about like eight, nine, probably like seven. You know, as far as back I, as I can remember, you know, when, when things start becoming a memory. So your your first beef is uh, a robbery and attempt? Yeah, attempt murder. How old were you then? I was uh, 16. 16. Tell me about that. Well... At the time, I was doing I was doing robberies. I had moved to the Lincoln. My mother had moved to the Lincoln, so I was running with the Lincoln crew back then, Warren G and all of them. So we was basically robbing the same thing, like supermarkets and all that stuff. That we came across a, a large money of cash, and um, back then, Dust Angel Dust was the product back then. So me and him had to invest in that because we were smoking in it at the time. You know what I'm trying to say? But at that time. We invested in it, and being that my sister Ruby was already had all that shit in the Bronx, I tried to slip something in on one of her workers, 
and shit. But when I sent when I when when when, uh, when Vaughn went up there to try to get some money from him, he tried to like tell him like, "Yo, he ain't got nothing for him." So when I went up there and I was like, "Yo, why? You know, this is part of him." Blah blah blah. So we got into an argument, and I wound up you know shooting him over some shit like that, you know. I never did got the money back, but he told right off the top, you know what I'm saying? You know, so I had a bronze case at that time, and I had a a um, a, um, a, a, a robbery case in uh in Manhattan. At the same time. At the same time, because like the ballistics from the gun had showed somebody got shot in a in a supermarket in uh in Manhattan or on Columbus Avenue, so. What happened was that they took they 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 had I had a Manhattan case and I had that case, so they ran it together, and I had a four to, I copped out to a four to twelve. So at sixteen, you went to prison for four years. Minimum. Five years, I did five years. Yeah, out so of you it. did five on that four to twelve. So you touched back down. You're twenty one years old. Well, when I touched back down at twenty one years old, I was twenty I was twenty two when I got home because you got to remember how my birthday fall. But at the uh-huh. same time, when I came home. I was like, man, you know, I'm seeing like, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm looking at Rich. I'm I'm hearing stories of Rich LA and all them, you know what I'm saying? Because we grew up together. But when I when I when I'm hearing these stories, I'm like, damn, we they finally got what we always used to talk about, you know what I'm saying? Others in the street. So when I got there, I came home, my man Danny getting money, everybody getting money, people that I wasn't getting no money when I when I left the street. And I'm like, oh man, you know, I'm trying to play catch up. So, you know, every day. I'm calling my man. I'm like, yo, look, you know what I'm saying? We we buying outfits. But when I first came home, um, when I first came home, I started working with my uh my brother Kite, as always, you know what I'm trying to say? And he had like a, a spot that was that used to have the cheese line from 29th Street to like 30, 31st Street. You what know was what he I'm pumping? Saying? Huh? What was he pumping? At 29th Street. What, what was the uh, crack? Uh, that was crack? the crack era. This is the, right. the whole crack era in 88. This is 88. So, so when when did you come home? 88. That's when you came home. Right. Okay. All right. You know, so you're 22, home. you come home in 88, everybody popping with the crack thing. Right. So your brother got it going, got the cheese right. lines. And all I could think of was just, you know, the red parrot pumping, pumping the rooftop. So I'm just really trying to play catch up. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, yo, look, I can't wait to get a car. I stayed in Parkchester six months until they started stealing my car. Then I went to Jersey because when I left, Parkchester was the place to live. When I came back, it's not the place to live. So, you know, I went across the water, you know, like that. But um, like I said, like the 80s is is un, it's unexplainable, the fun that you had in the 80s, because, you know, like I said, everybody was getting money. So we had something to do. But I just like I couldn't I was impatient. You know what I'm saying? I went from I went from buying jewelry from Apollo Gems to going down downtown to down, Diamond District buying buying jewelry. You know what I'm saying? Every day I had to take a picture because, like, I used to tell my man Danny, I used to be like, "Yo, look, these pictures right here, these pictures are memories." So when you get something happen, like when like you like when I got locked up on my KC, I had a bunch of pictures of us from when he had the Benz, the Suzuki, from when I had, you know, what I'm saying the MP, the BM. All my cars and all, you know, different girls and all that stuff like that. So I used to tell them all that. So I got a whole bunch of pictures from that. You know what I'm saying? So I used to tell them, like, the, the 80s was, like, unexplainable, man. You know what I'm saying? You know? Indeed. Um, when did, well, do you remember the first time you shot somebody? What? How you felt? Nah, I don't remember all that. I can't remember how I felt, you know what I'm saying? You know, that's just like when you do do things like that, that's just on the spirit of the moment. And like, you know what I'm saying? It's either self-defense or you just trying to, you know what I'm saying? It's something that needs to be done. But as far as like having a feeling, I can't tell you a feeling or nothing that I ever did. You know what I'm saying? Because like like, like I said, a lot of times you don't be in that state of mind where you're thinking about a feeling or you don't remember a feeling, you know? Yes, sir. Um. When uh, when you started hearing your your name being associated to uh, homicide, like your name synonymous homicide, the first time you heard that, did you accept that? Like, uh, how, or how did you feel about that when you first heard yo homicide, Lou? I'm not I'm not gonna say I accept it or you know I'm trying to say or I, I try to live up to that name. You know, a lot of names is given now. A lot of names is given by people now by themselves. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you know back then. 
you know, we go on first and last names, you know what I'm saying, from school or whatever, you know what I'm trying to say, that's what you know a person by, or whatever nickname is given, they given for a reason. But at the same time, what I'm trying to say is that I never lived up to that name, and a lot of people, I don't even appreciate people calling me that uh, my name, but at the same time, like I am, I'm a, I'm a product of, of, of that era, you know what I'm trying to say, and I was just doing what, you know what I'm trying to say, what the streets, you know what I'm saying, taught me to do, you know what I'm saying, Cause you got to remember, I went away at an early age, so I ain't never get the privilege of, you know what I'm saying, uh, you know what I'm saying, schools and growing up like you know, others that came before me, but it like it, 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 it could have been a hum to Allah. Allah had this in plan for me because a lot of them not here. So the things that I went through, it taught me to be the person that I am now. So a lot of things, like I say, I grew up with my brother. was a lot of learning there, but I also learned a lot of stuff when I went to prison. You know what I'm saying? And I came home and I just put all that together, and that's what, that, that's what made me the person that I am now. You know? Indeed, indeed. Um, I'm going to read some... Uh some of the uh, information that I came across in studying for your situation. On, on October 27, 1994, Charles Leon Brown, along with three others, was arrested and charged with multiple drug offenses. Two weeks later, he started meeting with government agents to discuss his cooperation. During those many profit sessions, he detailed various activities of the lynch mob. He was responsible for the arrests of 10 alleged lynch mob members, including yours. In addition, he helped the government solve 30 previously unsolved murders. How did the 142nd Street lynch mob come into being? Well, everybody had a crew, so just a, just a name, just, you know, just, the name just stuck. You know what I'm saying? You know, everybody, like every, every part of the area of Harlem, even Brooklyn, Queens, you know what I'm saying? Whatever it was, they just struck, whether you say it's 40 projects, you know what I'm saying, St. Nick gang or whatever, you know what I'm saying? All that shit just stuck. You know, so the the lynch mob name came about from really it really came from when we just started throwing bus rides and all that stuff like that. And every time I used to be on the bus rides, I used to always play uh, Ice Cube music and all that stuff like that. You know what I'm trying to say? So we used to always out how, how our lynch mob, you know what I'm saying, the guerrilla lynch mob like that on, on, and stuff like that. But you know, and when we had the uh, the uh, t-shirts printing up, that that was basically on it. But you got to remember. When we threw the bus ride, they had other groups that was that partaked in uh, with us too. You had ABC, the Alcoholic Beverly's crew, and then we had uh, Best Out. You know what I'm saying? We had other lot. Then we had the Forty Wolves that came up under us. You know what I'm saying? Even though it was Forty Wolves before us, but the younger crew. You know what I mean? That's right, no doubt. Um, was there another clique in the city that also called themselves a lynch mob? If so, would there have any com confusion no, because of the common name? No. Oh yeah, from the Bronx, the Willis, which one the, the Spanish dude? I ran into them on uh, in uh, MCC. Yeah, cool couple of Spanish brothers up there. Yeah. yeah, they got they they got strong reputation, man. Stand yeah, yeah, up dudes on yeah. both sides of the fence. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I fuck with them when I was in MCC. I never got to see them when I when, when, after my travels, like throughout the prison system. But MCC, Otisville, yeah. Uh, who is Ralph Black Wallace? Well, he was a member. Of, he was a, a a part of my case. Yeah, you and him, yeah, did y'all have a long history, y'all? Yeah, we grew up together. We grew up together. Yeah, he's a little older than me, but, you know, we grew up together. And who was Charles Fat Leon Brown? Well, he was, I guess that me and him met along, me and him met when I came home in 88. Even though he said he went to school with me, I can't remember him back then, you know what I'm saying? Because I really stayed in school very, I went to school very rarely, you know what I'm saying? I was mostly in the street, especially when it came to junior high school and high school. You know, if I had, if I had a means to be in the street to, to sell some drugs or whatever like that, that's when I'm at. I come to school when I'm, when I'm, when I'm fly, whatever like that, because you know, like back then it was a fashion show. But I met Leon on, on, um, through Black, and how we really got tight is because uh, one day I was going to the rooftop and he was standing outside his car. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that he just standing because he had a sweater on. I'm like, OK, so I pulled over. When I pulled over, I got out and started talking to him. He told me some dudes that robbed him. And I was like, robbed you? He said, yeah, they took my coat and they took my money and my chain. I'm like, yo, get in. I had a, um, a Nissan Standard photo with the one piece BBE, BBEs back there. So we went up the block. He told me which one it went up. So we going up each and down, going up the avenue, but going through each block, we found the dudes on 49th. But when I cut out the car, I had a tech that I used to carry on the screen. I used to carry it on the screen under my Woolridge, but I'm going to the rooftop. But I, 
So when I when I, when I see them, they see me get out the car. They happy because I went to IS10 with them. Mm-hmm. But then when they see him get out, they frown. I'm like, yo, such, yo, this is my man, blah, blah, blah. So they gave the coat back in the chain, but I told them, yo, they let them keep the money due to the fact, you know, they got to get something. You know what I'm saying? It was like $1,500, $2,000. So I just, I just let them do that. But at the same time, you know, I let them know, yo, that's my man right there, you know. But they robbed them in front of Willie Burgers. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They robbed them in front of Willie Burgers, you know. Mm. Uh, did you send a letter to Leon asking him why he was cooperating that he in turn gave to the feds? It was something like that. No, I ain't know. I ain't asked him why he was cooperating. I just told him to chill, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, everything is good. We good. You know what I mean? All right. What 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 made him, what was in that letter, do you think, that made him tell, like, think he was being threatened? It wasn't nothing in that letter to be threatened. Like, it was just basically like, yo, just chill out. We got the lawyers, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Get the get the second lawyer to this lawyer right here. We we good. But at the same time, everybody try to, you know, it was like it was like a no win situation I was in. You know what I'm trying to say? The prosecutor just put it on the table like, yo, look, we want him out of everybody. You know what I'm trying to say? So if you came in and you had something because you had people that was in MCC that wasn't on our case trying to jump on our case. But then you had people like Hot Dog Cliff. I'm most definitely gonna scream him out because because um he took he took a letter that I wrote to somebody else to the prosecutor and told them, yo, look, this is what he said. But all I said was, I said, Joe, don't even come see this dude. Don't even fuck with this dude because this is what this dude doing. But then that that's was the reason why they gave me a request to jury and they had me on separation from the whole case. So if you look, even my even my co-defendants that wasn't telling for a minute, it had to take me to get back with them because they used to have me in the jury section and have them right here. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, yo, I can't even talk to my lawyer. At the desk, you know, I'm trying to say y'all separate, but what they trying to make me see is that yo, any day, any one of these going going to be on me. But at, but at the same time, a few the uh, uh, my, uh like four or five of my co defendants they didn't. You know what I'm saying? So we all went we went to we went to trial in the middle of trial. Once we realized that what uh what the case was going to be, that they was going to accept people that was lying. You know what I'm saying? Because they found out people that was lying. On our case, that's why certain people got like Fat Leon Brown and the rest of them, they got life sentence because they got caught lying. You know what I'm saying? So when they cop out to a, a indictment that calls for life, that's what you get when you get caught lying. So that's what they got. You know what I'm saying? So now if I'm looking at it like, damn, y'all, you know, y'all motherfuckers, even after they did the federal case, they tried to come back on my state case, which was an Alabama case, and try to tell on me on that case, you know, trying to say to get the 5K1 back. You know what I'm trying to say? You know, trying to try and got on the stand. The most, the most effective um, person that got on the stand with was Derek Razor, Bootney. You know what I'm saying? Because he went back to 1976 when we was kids. You know what I'm saying? Playing, you know, robbing people in front of the school. Because you know, like I said, when we was kids, we used to go to supermarkets still, but we used to come back and rob the kids that was packing bags. So he went all the way back to there. You know what I'm saying? You know, and this, you know, when he went back to there, he told. He, t- he 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 was like the character witness of that, you know what I'm saying? So he was like a, a, a effective witness, and I got convicted because of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ultimately, because yeah, I still don't, yeah, I still don't, I still on death penalty on on death row for like three years. You know? Yeah. I'm going to paraphrase a newspaper article from the summer of 1995. For more than five years, the lynch mob waged what prosecutors called quote, a reign of terror, end quote, in Harlem, murdering rival gangsters, shooting bystanders, and terrorizing the neighborhood surrounding Lenox Avenue uh, and 142nd Street. In 1994, members of the lynch mob slipped into Harlem Hospital dressed like surgeons. Police reported their intentions were to stab to death a rival drug dealer whom had somehow survived an attempt on his life just a few days earlier, despite being shot 15 times with high caliber handguns. In 1995, Mary Jo White, The then United States attorney in Manhattan announced the arrest and indictment of 10 people she had, she said, were members of the murderous gang known as the 142nd Street Lynch Mob. This 86 count indictment charged you and nine others alleged members uh, of your crew under federal racketeering laws, and you were all potentially facing the rest of your lives in prison. Although the government charged your group with 15 murders and nine attempted murders, they stated publicly that they suspected the lynch mob of as many as 40 murders. When you have, when you were notified of the federal indictment, did you fully understand the magnitude of the charges you were facing? 
Like you really get like, yo, this is. Yeah, I thought it. I thought it was over at the time, but like I said, like you know, the newspaper gonna hype up anything anyway. You know, I'm trying to say, especially when they got a case like that, and the prosecutor trying to make a name for itself. So therefore, they're trying to get the jurors to hear it. So when they do come, and they could be biased toward the case. That's right. But at Court the same opinion. time, a lot of the, a lot of the charges was trumped up. You know, what I'm saying I either beat them in the state, or. A lot of people, like I said, a lot of people was lying just to lie. You know what I'm trying to say? So the process, when you got dirty prosecutors, they'll be like, yo, even if you don't know nothing, you know what I'm trying to say, we're going to help you remember something. You know what I'm saying? So that was basically our case because really I, was, I wasn't I was never supposed to serve time. You know what I'm trying to say? How's Due that? to the fact because they never had a case on me. They never had no physical evidence on me. You know what I'm trying to say? And then you had lawyers like Anthony Rico you know what I'm trying to say? And all y'all and all y'all niggas in the street still hug, hugging on to him, but he's a piece of shit. You know what I'm trying to say? He not only fucked over the the the, the first World Trade Center bombers, but he also fucked over my case too because it's like a confluence of entrance. You know what I'm saying? Because he spoke on a tape saying that he didn't he didn't he didn't like me or whoever because we did something to him. That was a conflict of interest back then. You know what I'm trying to say? So that was grounds for me to either, for him to even say that he wasn't going to take the case or he was going to dismiss himself. You know what I'm saying? And I'm speaking on this shit for people to know, especially our circle, to know what type of nigga he is. You know what I'm trying to say? Excuse my language for, for saying that, but sometimes sometime the word is deserving. Yeah, no doubt, you know no I mean? doubt. So you telling me that your lawyer. Not my lawyer, my co defendant lawyer. Oh, your Cody's lawyer. Right had personal grievances with you. Right. Based on what? What I just told you. you he said on personal? a documentary, this is he didn't like me or whatever because of, we did something to a person that was close to him. Oh. So therefore, he's supposed to accuse himself because Absolutely. now that we know this, bow. So therefore, I feel that, you know what I'm trying to say, if we went to trial in April and these people got court line in October, it, it was a, if he was if he was a if he was a, any kind of a lawyer, he would have been like, yo, look, they got lying in, in October. So therefore, we could have dismissed the indictment and got a whole new indictment. Instead of all, they took us to trial on the same indictment. You know what I'm saying? And us being naive to the law, you know what I'm trying to say, we copped out to that indictment, which wasn't the original indictment. You know what I'm trying to say? Because how can you get an original indictment for somebody that lied at the grand jury? And you know it. Right. So now, years later, when I when I get all this F from freedom of information, all this information from fighting my federal case, the they refused to overturn my federal case because they said it had no merit. Why? Because I couldn't find the documents because they 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 said it was lost in the archives, and I couldn't find the disc of us saying, "Yo, look, you know what these people be testifying." But they knew they was lying in October. We went to trial in April. You know what I'm saying? And that was one of the reasons why we copped out because why we 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 facing crimes that we know we didn't commit. You know what I'm trying to say? So therefore, if they putting all the crimes on one person and they be like, yo, I didn't do that, what the fuck? You know what I'm trying to say? So now they I'm looking at it like, damn, so th it ain't no way I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna beat it. But now when they found him lying, if he had said that or we had known what happened instead of me finding from freedom of information, that's like then there's six months that they was they found him telling. They supposed to told us that as soon as we got the trial or before we got the trial. That's that's part of the part of our our, our, our four one. You know what I'm saying? That's right. You know. So really, I just served time just to serve time. You know what I'm saying? You know because if I had they had to come back with another indictment, I probably I probably could have beat the case. You know what I'm trying to say? Or you know, I got less of time. Right. So, had you ever heard of the uh, Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organizations Act or the RICO before you were you faced with it? No, not at all. But I, you know, me, I'm, 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 a, I'm a type of person. I'm not gonna sit there and just, you know, what I'm saying I'm gonna go to that law library and do what I gotta do. So, therefore, I did a lot of research, and then we had a lot of people that was there that was helpful, that that was there before me. That you know, what I'm saying that you know, what I'm saying that helped me. Like you know, what I'm saying like when I when I when I got my death penalty case, Doc Shakur. Tupac father, he came to me in the yard. You know, I'm fresh on the compound. I'm not kidding, but I'm gun ho because I'm like, I got all this time. I'm busting anything. So when I see him, 
He come to me, yo, I got to see you, man. Meet me down the Lord. I'm like, yo, what the fuck is this? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yo, I'm gonna punish this old nigga, right? So I'm come, I know I'm coming down. I'm like, I'm not even talking. I'm coming down because I want to get the fuck out of Atlanta anyway. I want, I want, I'm trying to get up to Lewisburg. Well, they had you a USB, right? My first jail. So anyway, when we get up there, they tell me who he is. So when we get up there, he had me. You know, we kicked it and shit. You know, and I'm like, you know what I'm saying? Just like, you know, I'm looking at him. Like, okay, you know what I'm saying? The old head from the from the town, and you know. And he did a lot for the community too, you know what I'm saying? So now I'm on it, but at the same time, he had me fill out a whole lot of uh, 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 letters. I mean, write a whole lot of letters to different organizations that was dealing with the death penalty. One of them picked it up, and that was the one from Alabama, which was a blessing because the case was in Alabama, and they helped me. So he used to tell me, yo, look, I'm gonna tell you what we what's appealable, but you got to do it yourself. Like every night, I used to read. I used to wake up like two in the morning and read my case over and over again. Even if I read it over already, I read it over and over again to and just find certain things that I thought was appealable, and I send it to the lawyer or I take them to him on the visit. You know what I mean? So, and it just so happened when one day I'm in a hole. I'm in Max Unit in Atlanta, and um. I get a letter and say my case was overturned. You already know what I started dealing. I started screaming like a mug. I woke everybody up. And they was like, yo, what's going on over there? I started sending a letter all the way around, you know? How long had you been sitting at that point? Oh, what you mean? In the whole At, at the point in which? Oh, three you, years. How many? Three years. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So so you've been in the hole for three years? Nah, I, I went in... to the hole for something else. And they sent me up to Max Unit because, you know, like back then, if you— Back then, they it was it was it wasn't a lot of pens back then, so therefore, when you get transferred back then, they was holding you in the hole for a, a long process, even after you've been sanctioned. What does that mean to be sanctioned? Be sanctioned for like whatever you went to the hole for mm-hmm. before you before, whatever you went to the hole for before you got your days or whatever you're gonna be in the hole or transfer or sent to a program or stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Um. What went through your mind when you first found out that that Leon was cooperating against you? Because y'all were pretty fucking close. No, I ain't bro. believe it. And you know, I, the the thing about it, I ain't believe it. And I had my 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 co-defendants. They ain't understand why I ain't believe it. You know what I'm saying? Like my, one of my co-defendants, he came in and he was like, "Yo, that nigga brought me in. He set me up and everything." And I'm like, you know what I'm saying? Yo, stop that. Stop telling that shit. You know what I'm saying? Even when he was in the bullpen with us. You know what I'm saying? But when the next day came and he wasn't, the next court day came and he wasn't, I was like, oh, shit. You know what I'm saying? He was like, I told you. You know what I'm saying? But I'm ready to fight him in the bullpen. Like, yo, stop saying that shit, you know, because this is my man. You know what I'm saying? We done brought cars and jewelry for each other and all that. You know what I'm saying? Birthdays and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? You know? Yeah, that's, that's, that's. I probably wouldn't even speak to a human being again after that kind of a betrayal. Like, yeah, you, you. I mean, it, I, I feel the same way. But you know, like you know, if I got ask, if I'm if I must sit here and act like and ask Allah to forgive me for my faults, I got to forgive them. So I don't hold no animosity towards them or nothing. You know, they forgiven. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I I'm not gonna stand there and hold no conversation with them. You know what I'm trying to say? Or being, you know, you know, if it, if if you know if they happen to come around. I'm gone. That's y'all space. You know what I'm saying? Because I don't want them to feel threatened by me. You know what I'm saying? You know? Right, right. The founders of Murder, Inc. Records, Irving and Christopher Lorenzo, had publicly adapted the last name of a real-world gangster in place of their own and became the Gottis. In January 2003, federal agents and New York Police Department investigators raided Murder, Inc. headquarters. The raid was part of a year-long investigation resulting in Chris and Irv Gotti being charged with money laundering and conspiracy to launder money, which are, you know, predicate offenses of the RICO. I share that to preface this. Did you ever consider that perhaps adapting the name Lynch Mob not only encouraged the actions of the police, but also your crew's behavior? No, I don't think so, because, like, the Lynch Mob wasn't no gang. So half of the people that saying they are part of Lynch Mob ain't no Lynch Mob because it's not no gang. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's not no gang. It's not like you had to take a membership or, you know, I'm trying to say, oh, you running up on the, you know what I'm saying? And then they put a, they, then they put it from 142nd Street. So you got a whole lot of people that claim a lynch bomb that ain't even from 142nd Street. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? So, you know, the feds, like I said, the feds can take anything and hype it up to make it seem one way than what it, than what it really is. You know what I'm saying? So to make the media hype or whatever. Like they said, I was driving around, jumping out my van, and everybody was running. I don't remember none of that. You know what I'm saying? You know? You know? It's something when you 
when you and, and I learned this as a child, as a young young fella, and um, it helped me to navigate, stay out of shit. You can easily enough convince people that you are a monster. What you have a really hard time doing is unconvincing them once they believe that. You know, I, I mean, I hear that all the time, man. You know what I'm trying to say? I hear that a lot of times because. A lot of people, a lot of people that don't know me, they they say this, but a lot of people that that do know me, they will tell you I stay on joke time all day long. I snap all day long. You know what I'm saying? I play all day long. But then they they then they say yo, it's another side to me. But you know, it's a reason why it's another side to me. You know what I'm trying to say? Because a lot of things, a lot of people ain't been through what I've been through. You know what I'm saying? Half of my bid on lockdown, I've been locked down more than I was in population. You know, trying to say for holding a town down that I found down at the end of my bid was a bygone. You know, trying to say right. because you had you had a bunch of dudes that was coming. Like when we first came in the system, me, Prince, and uh, you know the Supreme team and a whole lot of us, we held that shit down. I mean, we communicate from prison to prison. So when you wrote me a letter and tell me this dude coming here or this dude coming here, that's what it is. You know what I'm saying? Nah, you ain't gonna come over here and think you're gonna live and they kick you out there regardless. You know what I'm saying? So. Whether you're a homie or not, it's a reason why the homie got you off the compound here. If you're a violation from another state, you already know what's going to happen. You know what I'm trying to say? Either your people going to get rid of it or we going to get or it's going to be a war. But at the same time, I fell into the habit of that and realized that the younger dudes that was coming in, they wasn't thorough. Like Maybe they didn't you know, experience the, the, the Rackers Island and juveniles that we did to make us the person that we was. You know what I'm trying to say? And when I say that, I held it down due to the fact it was like a it was a reflection. Now I'm not saying nothing bad about the Bloods, but when they first came in, it wasn't a lot of them. Right. So the West Coast dudes was dogging them. You know what I'm trying to say? But I was like, yeah, nah, nigga, come over here and come home, sit over here. You know what I'm saying? But now they deep. You know what I'm saying? But every line they come on, and this this is a known fact. Every line, every 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 jail I come into, they always fall in line and come back home. You know what I'm trying to say? On the strength of that. You know what I'm saying? So that makes the numbers and, and uh. And New York even hot, even bigger because I never fell on the compound where it was over a hundred New York dudes. You know what I'm really? saying? Not not to say that, you know, I I would like to say that it was because of the affluence I probably would have had. But Lewisburg, Allenwood, I never came to them jails unless I was locked down. Lewisburg, I was locked down for 18 months. Then I went to Allenwood for the state for the for the for the, uh, the step down program. Everything else, I was always away. I was in California, uh, Colorado. You know what I'm saying? The closest I've been home was Virginia, and um, and uh, and Kentucky, and uh, and uh, uh and Hazleton. You know, the Midwest. So I wasn't never home. I never was close to home. You know. So you didn't get very many visits. Nah, not even. Nah, no, nah, I got visits. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a hum do a law. You know, and I, you know, what I'm saying I want to thank all the females that helped me down during that time. You know what I'm saying? Make sure I had a visit, but I was getting a visit. Like at least once or twice a month, you know what I'm saying? Whether whether it was my friends sending them, you know what I'm trying to say, my brother and all of them, they was making sure that I had that, you know what I'm saying? Make sure the commissary was right. But like I said, I, even though they, they was making it, I still lived off the land, you know what I'm saying? And like I said, I never really got a, a enjoyable to get get the, you know what I'm saying, enjoy some, some of the, like, the visits that I, I was getting because I was locked down. And most of the time they'll be on TV or behind the glass. It's crazy. Right. It's crazy. Uh, a lot of cats don't think about what it is to do time when they doing what they do. They don't really think about, you know, they be like, you know, it come with the game. True indeed. But what is it? Yeah. What is the actual but That's experience? what I'm saying. It took me it took me a minute to realize it. But one day I, I was on lockdown, you know what I'm saying? And one thing about females, if they really if they really like you or as you say in the old language, dig you, you know what I'm trying to say? They gonna be there for you, but you gotta give them what they want too. They gonna hold you down, but at the same time, they miss they miss the telephone calls and the visits too. So when you take that away from them, where you just writing letters, that takes away from them. So the first thing they say is like, "Yo, Lou, I know you gotta do what you gotta do," but at the same time, you know what I'm trying to say. You need to start thinking about us. You know what I'm trying to say. You don't know, look. I miss the phone calls too because this like every other week phone call. That shit is like. That shit is like wearing, tearing on me. You know what I'm saying? Right. The letters is cool, but the letters ain't coming as you writing them. If you writing a letter every day, they're not coming in that fashion where I'm receiving them every day. You know what I'm saying? You know? So now it be, now you start, you got to start thinking about family members and like, yo, damn, I miss, like, you know. And I and that's one thing about my co-defendant, one of my co-defendants, he did a lot of his time up north, 
you know, trying to say FCIs and all that shit. And I was like, yo, damn, he a much smarter person than me because he knew off the top, yo, New York was a bygone. I'm not holding down no state that, you know, I'm trying to say that that ain't even, you know, trying to hold down their own self. You know what I'm saying? So, but like I said, I was holding it down because a lot of times I'm looking at it, it was a reflection of me. You know what I'm saying? So if you're doing something to anybody from New York, whatever, 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 what part they're in, that's a reflection of me. So you know I'm on the compound. Nah, that's not happening. You either bring it to me and let me handle it, or yo, look, this is what it is. So that, you know, I fell into a habit of that all the way until I came home. You know? Yeah. That could have held you back. That could have kept you right. in there. Like I said, like, you know, a lot of times, you know, like I said, New York was a bottom. Like when I came in the when I came in the system, New York was like one of the number one besides DC and, you know, other states that was representing. But we had sales, TVs and all that, but as I went to programs, I come back to like pe- places like uh, Adwater, Victorville. We don't have no sales, no nothing. So now I comes on a compound. I got to push for TVs for, uh, you know what I'm saying, sales and all that for us to be comfortable. You know what I'm trying to say? They ain't got no kitty where, you know, we got money in it. You know what I'm trying to say to do what we want to do. We can't have them. So now, you know, when when I get there, I got to have all these functions. Like, yo, let, let, let them know. Like, yo, look, I'm here now. So this New York is most definitely in this joint right here. So all y'all motherfuckers that were thinking that, you know what I'm saying, was saying New York wasn't nothing in this jail, now we we going to be something. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, you know. And, and uh, you weren't doing that under the lynch mob flag. You was doing nah, that under, I was the, doing under the New, New York, York flag, flag. But at the same time, you know, I, I appreciate a lot, of, a lot of dudes that I started out with, a lot of good men. And when I say good men, you know, we held each other down, whether whether my DC homies, you know what I'm saying, Detroit, California, you know, Crips and Crips and Bloods, I fucked with everybody, you know what I'm saying? So because we had a history from back then, from, you know what I'm trying to say, you know, when we was younger and we grew up in these in this in this institution. So we had a history, you know, even dealing with the Muslims, you know, sometime if I come on a on a compound, um, Sharif status, we'll get together, you know, trying to say because he know the influence, so we'll get together so we can keep a lot of the bulls down because you know nobody don't want the jail to be locked down, but that's what the that's what the the federal pens is, has become. They become locked down now. Any little thing, you remember when when we first came in, somebody then had to get killed for them to lock it down. Now. It can be a fight, and they locking it down. You know, you don't want to spend your time like that. You know what I'm saying? It's just like me being in lockdown all over again. You know what I mean? So you're in population, but you still, you still locked. Right. Yeah. But that, I think a lot of that comes from because, like, when we first came in, a lot of a lot of prisoners that was coming to the feds, you got to remember, they had money then, you know what I'm trying to say? But they start bringing a lot of dudes that was that didn't have money. You know what I'm trying to say? A lot of petty cases, like gun cases and shit like that. Even bank robbers came in, they had some money. But as it went on and on, what happened was they started sending like a lot of uh, um, uh, repeated, like say you, you went home, a violator's. Back to the, they start sitting on the pens and all that. So if you got a year left, you ain't trying to get in nothing. So a lot of things is going to shoot over your head. So what then a dude that's getting anywhere from 20 to 20 to 20 years of life, 20, it's a person that's doing 20, 20 years or to life, they ain't got a care in the world because, you know what I'm saying, it's like day for day in that motherfucker. So, yo, if they put a hamburger on a stove that's not cooked, we going to ride for that. You know what I'm trying to say? You know what I mean? Indeed. You know what I'm saying? Then, uh, then, it, then it come to a person that only got six months, a year left on a violation. They're going to be like, man, fuck that hamburger. I'm going to go back and eat a soup. You know what I'm saying? That's right. You know? So it's a lot to change. That's why I said, and I'm not saying that New York was a bygone. The federal system is a, uh, has become a bygone because right now, you know, if it wasn't for cameras, COs would still be getting away with a lot of shit. You know what I'm saying? So because... Back then, you can't. You they, they couldn't even put a hand on an inmate without the whole jail being in an uproar. You know what I'm trying to say? So it was mainly like, "Yo, look, just we we just gonna take you the whole. We're handling it from there." You know what I'm saying? But now they stomping people out right in front of you. You know what I'm saying? They, I'm looking like, man, damn. You know what I'm saying? So you know, and it's hard to partake because you're only one person. Right. You know what I'm trying to say? So if you only got a hand full of men that's ready to go, and everybody else just sitting back won't look. So why would you? Why would you? Why would you go out there and work and have them benefit it? You know what I'm saying? That's right. Another piece of information that I came across in looking at your situation. There was a detective at the 32nd Precinct named uh, James Mayer. 
Uh, he led a year-long investigation. That's the magic number, year-long. Uh, on the lynch mob, he was quoted by newspapers saying the gang's favorite method of execution was, quote, a headbanger, unquote, a quick shot to the head. Another article stated, quote, the gang's leader, Lewis Griffin, was originally arrested last summer on federal gun charges. Miss White said that's the U.S. attorney for people who don't know. Since then, life in a neighborhood once, quote, paralyzed by fear, end quote, had become noticeably safer in the year since his arrest. She added that the murder rate in the surrounding 32nd precinct had decreased by 54 percent compared to the previous year, attributing that dramatic decrease directly to your arrest. What went through your mind when you first heard that? Like I said, you know, they could, they, they could, they could feed the media one story and the media going to hype it up to make it look more than what it is. They got newspapers to sell. Right. You know what I'm saying? So they can That's sell That's your them. problem to figure out, right? But, uh, yeah. But at the same time, like I said, you know, when, it, when, it, when, it, when you hear something like that, you'd be like, wow, you know what I'm saying? How can they get away with something like that? But then again, you know what I'm saying? If, you know, if they doing it, it's, 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 it, now it's up to me when I go to trial to, to, to prove them other than that, other other than what they saying. You know what I'm saying? For the jury, that's why you try to ask for a jury of your peers, somebody that's known in that neighborhood. So they are known, they have know if, yo, if this was happening like that, we would know of it. You know what I'm saying? You know? I mean, what are the chances of you getting everybody in the hood you know, where we come from, nobody goes to jury duty. Like, so how are you going to really get a, a jury of your peers? People right. Really You're right. Nobody don't want to go. But at the same time, you know, that's what you wish for. You know, you try to do your best as far as like pick. Even when I was in, in my Alabama, in the Alabama state, you know what I'm saying? And it's crazy that uh, I had, when I when I beat my, 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 my death penalty case, it was a, a white juror, a white juror that was the, the, the foreman of the juror, mm -hmm. and she so happened to be a lawyer. So I'm just thinking like, yo, I already know I'm fucked up with her. You know what I'm saying? Because they picked her. But she was the one that found me not, the, you know, that, that, that read it not guilty. And I'm like, wow. You know what I'm saying? So it was like a whole new over shock. But like I said, this this Detective J. Mars, you know, he may say he studied my case for however many, t how many, other, many years he did. A year. But at the same time, he couldn't have studied the case because when he got on the stand, a lot of stuff he couldn't even collaborate with. You know what I'm saying? The shit that he, that he said, you know what I'm trying to say? It was like a conflict of interest from what you saying and what's in, my, what's, what's, what's in our, our paperwork that you know what I'm saying, that you said you did this following on this day and I had this, 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 and that. It, it was a conflict because when we asked you that and you're so familiar with the case, that means like, you know what I'm trying to say, you a part of it. You know what I'm saying? That's just like if me and you go out today, I can tell you what me and what we what we wore to this party next year or ten years from now. You know what I mean? All right, that's right. You know, that's right. And he's a detective, so he's especially right. supposed supposed right. to be able to keep track of details and so but forth. But you got to realize, a lot of time they they just try to clean up a lot of you know what I'm saying. Every ten years they be trying to clean up like our cases. You know what I'm trying to say? In a whole lot of cases, they just they just like flood the federal system because the state couldn't really get no convictions and they just snatched the, even with the lynch mob and all that, all of us flood MCC due to the fact they had to do that cleanup every 10 years. You know what I'm trying to say? Now, it don't take no rocket scientists to, to, to know what's going on because you know what I'm saying? Every 10 years, a certain president come in and they have this uh, a war on crime. You know what I'm saying? It's anti-crime shit budget. and they clear, they clear it up. You know what I'm trying to say? Then 10 years, then the next 10 years from that, they talk about uh, we concentrate on, on, on foreign affairs. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? So society need to not look at what they putting in the newspaper today, but what they put in, you know what I'm saying, the last couple of years or, you know, 10, 20 years from now. And I, I, I just go to say, to say that because a lot of times when I read the paper, I'm like, yo, this shit, this, this, you just printed this last week. And you come with this this week, so which one is it? You know what I'm trying to say? So if you're going over there and, and, in the Middle East and talking about y'all, y'all, he got making weapons of mass destruction, and then you got Colin Powell saying he found it, but later on he recanting his story, said, nah, I never, I never found that. You know what I'm saying? I just went by what they told me to say. You know, so which one is it? So now the media, if society is reading this and, and finding out, this like, 
you know, y'all can say what y'all want to say about Trump, but he gave me my days, which got me home. You know what I'm trying to say? In other words, I would have been here another, I would have been in another year, and he gave me my, 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 my stimulus money. And I'm not, and I'm, and I'm saying this because you look at, look at way stuff is now. We messed up now because, you know what I'm saying? It's like we still in a uh, depression. We still in a depression right now. Even though COVID is over, we still is holding it. But at the same time, they said, well, I'm looking at one day he said, they said that he said, he told a lady that, yo, look, if you feel that way, you need to go back to your country. He didn't say that. He said, if you don't, if you feel that way, then you need to find you another country. But they mixed the words up and they never would play it the way he said it. They just kept going. I'm like, yo, the media is crazy. You know controlling the narrative. Right. They crazy. So, you know, when you, you know, and I knew that from the beginning with my case, you know what I'm saying? From dealing with my case, from what they put in there. Uh, according to James K. Karlstrom, or Karlstrom, who was at the time the assistant director of New York office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, quote, unlike local arrests and prosecutions that often result in plea bargains and short jail terms, these indictments called for mandatory life terms without the possibility of parole, end quote. Some reports stated that as the gang's so-called kingpin, Mr. Griffin, who was rearrested in his jail cell at the Federal Metropolitan Correctional Center, could face the death penalty. What set you aside from the rest of your team as a candidate for the death penalty? Because uh, uh, because of the, the my uh, the charges, I had an eight forty eight. You were the C only one. You had an eight forty eight by yourself. CCE, yeah, yeah, CCE by yourself. You right. had a continuing criminal enterprise, right. an enterprise right. because they, by definition incorporates more than one person. Right, because they added up the drugs that we were selling up down up and down the East Coast, from you know what I'm saying from. New York, all the way to Alabama, Delaware, Virginia. You know what I'm saying? Carolina. They, they, you know, they, they add that up, and they, and I had more. Well, they said I had more than five to ten people under me that I command. That's the prerequisite for being a kingpin, right? Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. It's a lot of people that that got that. You got a guy on every block, especially during the time we was running around, there was a guy on every block that was hitting somebody who was hitting two other people who was giving work to three other people. There you go. Yeah. You know? Um, the 10 defendants were charged with 15 murders and nine attempted murders, five of them bystanders who were seriously wounded by indiscriminate gang gunfire. They were also charged with armed robberies and running a multi-million dollar crack cocaine business, distributing hundreds of pounds of cocaine and crack in Harlem and opening a wholesale drug distribution network down the East Coast and into Alabama and Louisiana. Federal Prosecutor Mary Jo White said, quote, the alleged enforcer of the group nicknamed Homicide Lou was arrested last year following killing near Columbia University. Homicide Lou has been charged with murdering 10 people and attempting to kill three others, end quote. At the time, Detective Ray Mayer commented, quote, the lynch mob had reached maturity. It had wiped out its rivals and, on the streets of Harlem and was uh, branching out. They had moved in on Maryland and even as far as North Carolina. One of the murders was in Alabama. Anyone crossed them, watch out, end quote. Police also stated that, quote, members of the gang held court on the corner of 142nd Street and Lenox Avenue, wearing T-shirts that showed the silhouette of a man hanging from a tenement building and sported the name of the gang, end quote. The name lynch mob struck terror in the hearts of local residents who feared reprisal if they spoke with the police, Mayor said. The big break came in August of 1994 when Homicide Lou wandered out of the lynch mob's turf for a hit near Columbia University. The day students were moving in, Mayor said, outside of their neighborhood, nobody ever heard of them and people weren't afraid to step forward and talk. James Kylstrom, assistant director of the FBI's Manhattan office, said, we are treating the drug gangs uh, much uh, in the same way as we uh, would organize crime like the mafia. And that will help nip them in the bud. Can you describe the day that the feds came for you for the lynch mob case? You was you were locked at that time when they came for you that family, that case. You was already sitting for your for a gun beef, right? Federal gun beef. Yeah. Right. So what, you you were in your cell. I, I know you must have known. No, I wasn't rearrested. I mean, that's something that they put in the in the paper to satisfy society. But they never call me down and they'll rearrest me, fingerprint me, and say, you know what I'm saying? You this is the new charges that you get. But what they did when my next court date came. 
they presented more more uh, co-defendants as well as more charges. You know what I'm saying? So when your next court date came, that was on your gun charge that you were already sitting right, on. Right, but even then I wasn't really facing, I was facing a conspiracy over my gun charge. You know what I'm saying? How's a that? A conspiracy that I just so happened to be, just just say like, if I'm I'm someplace where you doing business with this person, I just so happened to be there. Regardless if I know what's going on, what you passed in that bag, and when he passed, I was just there. So therefore that made me a part of the conspiracy. You know what I'm saying? So that was my next charge after when my code defendants came. But then after that, you know, I guess they must have realized that what these feds had, even though everybody was on minor charges, you know what I'm saying, they ran the charges up themselves. You know what I'm saying? Because you know they that's how the MC. The feds, the feds ran the charges up. No, my well, code defendants ran, ran the charges up themselves. because how so? Because what, what the feds didn't know, they added to it. It added more to it that we didn't have nothing just to try to get out of jail because if you know if you know like one thing one thing I I I I, I um I remember from the beginning of my case I had this brother named Ice that was on on Boy George case and he told me he said Joe look before before we before we finish this sentence the rats gonna outrun us and he went to explain he was like yo look you know every day. They coming in, the rats is they they pulling dudes over and trying to get on their case or explain it to them a way to get off their case. So now that just made it more rats as it, you know, more, you know what I'm saying, rats as it came along. So now so every co defender that came in, you had somebody approaching them, they, oh, you on that case? Oh, yo, you know what I'm trying to say? So they trying to either find out what they can find out or trying to coach them into because if they coach them into Going out there to see the people, they get credit for that. So now, the more they coach, that's the more they get. So now, when you get in there, dudes is like, okay, I'm in here. I, I, you know what I'm trying to say? They offer me five years, but I don't want to even do two years. You know what I'm saying? So therefore, that's what they're doing. They trying to like, find their way out. You know what I'm saying? You know, because I, I mean, you know, we can't, we, me and you can't run in the street. For a certain amount of years, split money and all this shit, and claim we love each other and all the rest of the shit done been through thick and thin. And then you come in here and you decide that, okay, you know, in other words, you could have killed me when I was on the street. Why would you have these people kill me? If you, Why would you stand on the death penalty knowing they're going to scrap me down and, 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 and going to fry me? You know what I'm saying? You know, so I'm looking at it like, damn, son, you could have, you know, I'm, a, I'm man, I love you so much. You could have called me in the middle of the night. And got me out the house and did something to me. Why would you do some shit like this? You know what I'm saying? Make it worse. Why would you let these people do it? You know what I mean? So, like, like that's how it is in this federal system. And, like, you know, when I said it was no physical evidence against me, that the feds don't need that no more because they got their physical evidence is the person that just, whether he make a story up or not. You know what I'm trying to say? Long as it's convincing and giving them what they want, that's what it is. You know what I'm saying? It just so happened that the first half came and they told their story but added so much in it that these people that came in the second time, they couldn't collaborate with it. You know what I'm trying to say? And they post that been there on this because that's how they came in. You know what I'm saying? So now they just get caught lying. You know what I'm saying? So you end up being a, a labeled a rat. You got the rat jacket, but you're still in the penitentiary for the rest of your life. Right. But then it don't really right now, it don't make a difference anyway, because like I said, like he told me back then, the rats gonna overrun us. You know what I'm trying to say? So I wouldn't be surprised if rats is running running the good dudes off the off the compound now, because there's so many of them, you know what I mean? So if you come in there talking about rat this, rat this, and all that, I'm not surprised. You know what I mean? Right. They get you up out of there. Right. Right, right. Yeah, I I, I had someone say that to me back during uh, the Don Diva days that it was getting to that point where cats wasn't even doing like they used to do. And as soon as you come up, hey, what's going on, man? It's good to see you, bro. Let me, let me see your PSI. Let me see your, let me see your paperwork. <laughs> Not, they didn't even do that no more. So did you ultimately plead guilty to eight murders and two attempted murders? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how were you able to beat the death penalty in Alabama of all places? Because somebody else had pleaded guilty to it. And the thing about it, when somebody I first pleaded guilty to the when body, when I first went to trial, they lost all the paperwork, the hard copy. They said they sent it to the feds, which I don't understand that when everything is computerized. You know what I'm saying? 
So that's what they told me. So they railroaded me my first because I didn't have I didn't have a chance. I didn't even have a paperwork and they wasn't giving me nothing. So that's how they railroaded me. But me having everything in my um for my federal case, I was able to get the case over overturned and came back on it. You know what I'm saying? You know? Yeah. Um after Leon's unanticipated betrayal, did you begin to doubt your other co-defendants, some of which you had only known for a few years? What you mean? Like for the ones that was telling? No, just at the point like no, nah, MCC, you know I mean? so MCC they they have a, they have a thing where is anybody that's that that's cooperating with the government that becomes a part of the government. You ain't got to worry about them coming to court until you go to trial. So therefore, you know what I'm saying? Everybody that's everybody that's official on your case that's not cooperating, they're gonna be at that stand at every court hearing. Right. So you 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 did it didn't make you basically, I was asking, did it not make you paranoid about everybody at that point? Because if like Leon, somebody whom you described. At that point, at that point, him. I just felt that it was over anyway. So I ain't really care about too much of anything. You know what I'm trying to say? You know? I just took that approach right there, you know. If I come to court, you ain't there, that's what it is. You know what I mean? Um, did you have to coordinate your plea with your Cody's? Like was like with Meech, his, yeah, that's his what they plea do. was contingent upon Terry. That's what agreeing. they do. They give you a, a global plea. Right. When everybody cop out to the uh to uh certain parts of the indictment. So was it difficult to get, you know, your Cody's to, to collaborate on those pleas? Not at all, because they, the like I said, the case was messed up from, from the beginning, so they needed a conviction anyway. You know what I'm saying? So if, if we had went all the way through trial, they would have had to produce those witnesses that went to the grand jury. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, if they would have, that means that the, we, was, we was being tried on a false indictment. So they needed that conviction. You know what I'm saying? So they pushed for that. That's why they offer the less time, you know what I'm saying, that we can get. So, you know, a person like, you know what I'm saying, at first I'm like, you know, looking at a triple, double life sentence, triple, double life sentence, or maybe even a death penalty, for me to come out and say, yo, well, shit, 30 years at my age, shit, I'm good with that. You know what I mean? How old were you? I was 29, just made 30. Yeah. Yep. It's a hell of a decision for a young man to have to make. Yeah, but when, you know, a lot of times when you, you make you know, decisions for for three decades of their I, life, you know, I had I had I had a few people come in. You know, what I'm saying like I said, it was a it was a hum do a law that a law put me through a lot of things where I was able to to deal with my prison sentence as well as being able to take that time because a lot of people that took less time than that they was like yo they couldn't do it. You know what I'm trying to say, and um, that was because they didn't have those experience. You know what I'm trying to say. See me. You know, y'all might find this be, me being arrogant or don't care, but you know what I'm trying to say? The jail setting was just another part of life for me, regardless. You know what I'm trying to say? So They started jailing very early. Right, early. So I, I automatically, when I when I went in, I already knew what it was. You know what I'm trying to say? What, what it was. So I already knew what I, what I had to do. And those that was my co-defendants, I put them in line the same way. Yo, look, this is what it is. So, you know what I'm saying? Arm oh, up, do this, 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 this is what we're going to do. You know what I'm saying? So me coming to a prison setting, that you know what I'm trying to say, that was just another part of life for me. You know what I'm saying? Only thing was missing was like me being able to do what I want to do. You know what I'm saying? Becoming sexual oppressed, shit like that. You know, that's the shit that that affected me the most. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean that's like what that. everybody imagine is that. You know what yeah, I mean? But the, you know, like like a lot of people be saying, yo, look, you. A lot of people coming home, they wasn't in their right state of mind, and you still got jokes and all the rest of that stuff. That's because, you know what I'm saying? You know, I didn't. I didn't allow myself to. You know what I'm saying? Let the institution, you know what I'm saying, take a pull of me. Whereas, you know what I'm saying, where they dictate me. Like, you know, if you read my institution, a lot of times I buck. Like, yo, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going out there and you know, mow no lawn with no motherfucking grass, with no, no uh. Push you know, mode. With no push no more. If that <laughs> shit ain't got the no motor on, I'm not doing that. Yo, put me in a hole. I'm cool. You know what I'm saying? So I was better off in the hole anyway because shit, I go to the hole, I make more money anyway. Cause if you send me a pack of cigarettes, I'm selling them shits for at least four for a book. And if it get pushed down to it, I'm gonna sell you one for a book if it's a, if it's a shortage up there. So I'm making more money in the hole. You know what I'm saying? So what the fuck? I give a fuck. I'm coming out with a hundred books. You know what I'm trying to say? 
You know what I'm saying? So I didn't really care about that shit. So I was really institutionalized before I even got there. So I just knew what it was. You know what I'm trying to say? Before when I got to there, first thing I'm talking about, yo, I'm, especially when I seen it was a bunch of Dominicans and MCC, I already know what it was. I was like, yo, you know what I'm saying? I'm tearing some shit up and I'm going to make me a knife and the first one get out of line, they're going to get butchered. I ain't got nothing to lose anyway. So one of somebody going to die, either me or them. You know what I'm saying? So that's the attitude I took. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of people be saying, yo, look, they be looking at me like, yo, damn, this thing must not have no feelings. I, yeah, I got feelings, you know what I'm trying to say, when it comes to my girl, my family, my kids and all that shit. Of course, I love them, but at the same time, I'm a survivor. I'm going to do what I got to do. You know what I'm trying to say? Another, another, in other words, before... I'm going to always have that non-approachable look on my face, and you, I'm not going to be approached. You know what I'm trying to say? If it do, that's what it is. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not, like I said, I'm not bragging on no shit. That's just me. You know what I'm saying? The same way I carry myself in the street, the same way I'm going to carry myself in jail. That's the way it is. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not tooting my own home because right now, I don't really tell these stories right here. I'm doing this, like I said, you my man, unique my man, I'm going to do whatever I can for y'all because at the end of the day, when, I, when it's my turn, I want to be able to call y'all and y'all there, regardless of whatever y'all do. But at the same time, I'd rather for another person to tell a story due to the fact, you know what I'm trying to say, they won't think that I'm being arrogant or something like that. You know what I mean? Right. You know, but this is just me. That's just me just being me. You know what I'm saying? You know? Uh, I was watching the video that Unique shot in Miami uh, for your Welcome Home celebration, right? And uh, he put a, a strong emphasis on your power in prison. How were you able to establish that power is it from having been in there so like i said when i came when i you know i you know like i'm a product of our state you know what i'm saying and and our state now is a lot of gangs in it and i'm not downplaying them but gangs is what it is that's a bunch of people that run together but back to, when i was coming to jail it was every man for themselves you know what i'm trying to say so even though i might i might be running the house when you come on rackers island and you come there and you my man if somebody asks you for your sneakers or something like that, nah, nigga, you're going to go and fight whether you lose or not because I'm not going to be there all the time. You know what I'm trying to say? And at the same time, when I came to Rackers Island, it was just like the same way when I came to uh, the federal prison. You know what I'm trying to say? It wasn't a lot of Harlem niggas in, in, on the island. So I had to represent straight off the top. You know what I'm saying? And um, the same way when I came to the feds, it wasn't a lot of New York dudes in, in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? So I had to represent off the top. So then I go, I, you know, during a period of time, the respect don't come because they already know what it is going to be at the end of the day. So you either, we either going we either going to butcher each other up, you know what I'm saying? Either one of us going to die or we going to butcher each other up, or you know what I'm trying to say? We going to settle the shit like men, or we just going to alleviate the shit. But it's all it all depends on where you bring it to me. Now if you bring it to me on this high level where we can't talk, like because I'm gonna always bring it to you calm. Well, try to keep it down here, but I do, if you all the way up here, then that's what you're going to get. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no need for us to keep talking with that loud shit. You know what I mean? That's right. We can, we can talk or we can war, but we can't talk about war. Right. Is it factual that five guys attempted to kill you in Otisville and obviously didn't succeed? Nah, that happened in all. In all. They try to say it happened in Lee County, but it ain't happened like that. Lee County, South Carolina? No, nah, in Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah. What happened when I, 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 uh, one of the homies that was from uh, upstate, me and him got into it over something that he did that was wrong. And I don't want to go into a long story with that, but, you know, I wound up butchering him. He stabbed me one time, and then I wound up going to the hospital because he stabbed me one time. Like, I, I got a little nip like this, mm -hmm. but it punched the liver. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to the hospital because when they told me I had to go, I'm like, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Just give me my patch. I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Then they, then they but, told you about septus. Right. So what happened was I had to go out. When I went up to the outside hospital, they said that I was bleeding on the inside. So they had to give me a zipper and, and, and sew that up. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it made it look better than what it looked, mm -hmm. than what it was. You know what I'm trying to say? When it got when it got out. But that's the only thing that really happened, you know. But the dudes that was there, they know that, you know, that the homie, he got what he deserved, you know what I'm trying to say? And at the same time, even though I, it could have been worse for me, but, you know, I turned out to be all right, though. Um, conviction on charges such as these typically result in natural life sentences, but you were given a statutory cap on your sentence of 30-year uh, imprisonment. Can you explain for those, of, uh, those watching what a statutory cap is? It's like when they take certain parts of an indictment out, 
and they give you, let you allow you to cop out to that, that part of the indictment and they dismiss all other accounts. And most of that, most of the time they do that is with a, uh, with a, a global plea where they try to get, you know, a group of people to cop out, you know what I'm saying? So to spare the expense of a trial on the, on the state, I mean, on the, on the, on the, on the, um, on the feds. So we um we have an unexpected pleasure to have our brother uh, OG Danny in the building. You know you have uh, some perspective on our brother Lou that a lot of people do not have, like especially people who might be watching this. And so we were able to convince you to come on camera and kind of share some of those perspectives, man. Um, uh, if you would, you know what I mean. Bless the people, bro. No, no questions, no questions. This is one of my childhood friends. Like, we go way back. Matter of fact, you know, when I first met him, he was in junior high school. P.S., no, what was that, 136? Yeah. We was in 136, and um, it was another one of us, God bless the dead, our man, Bo. He not here no more. And um, I knew Bo but I didn't know Lou, and Bo was in my class. So this the type of dude he is, right? He told Bo, <laughs> he said, Joe, you got this dude in your class, you're gonna have to fuck him up. He think he tough. But Bo told him, nah, that's my man, la da da. So, you know, Bo wound up telling me that, and then I wound up meeting him. And, you know, we just been solid ever since then, you know? So what made you say that, Lou? It's just like, it's just that, you know, back then, I had I had I had already knew, I mean I I I had already met him through, you know what I'm saying through a vision that I, one day I was gambling on 142nd and Seventh Avenue, and um, he used to be with this dude named Vic, you know what I'm saying, and Vic was like the bully of the neighborhood, and I had ran into Vic before over Bootney, you know what I'm saying? He had black Bootney eye before, you know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? So Vic was older than me. But, you know, he was like, you know, a rival. Like, I knew, like, yo, look, you know, I know any day this nigga, come, he come, you know, I'm going to have to be ready for him. I'm going to have to stab him, shoot him, or, or fight him one. But he was, you know, he had a little size on him. And the only person that he was respecting was, like, Tony Rome, Skip, and dudes like that. You know, dudes with his pairs, you know what I'm trying to say? But I remember him being with him. So I was like, the whole attitude was like, I was like, yeah, okay, if he be with him, I already know what it is. So when, I, when he was in the class, I was like, yo, Bo. That's the, you know, this is the dude, such and such and such. He used to be with the dude, Vic. So you probably got to fuck him up. You know what I'm saying? You know? Yeah. Off rip. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's just so ironic that, um you know, back then, I was on my shit. Like he said, you know, I was under Black Vic. He used, he used to be like a stick-up kid, take niggas money. He was young. We thought he was older, but he was 21 when he died. He got killed in the polo grounds by the police. Oh, he, he was on the elevator man. talking to a girl. Police officer told him, yo, let the elevator go. He pulled out on him, you know, young, like, yo, wait. A lot of the law didn't know it was undercover cop. Doors closed. Cop got off next floor, came down, killed him. But, um, you know, anyway, I met Lou through that experience. And I was on that type of time at a young age, bullying, taking people money, kids money. And I remember we first started hanging out and I was with him and Bo and I seen this guy, I used to take his money all the time, right? So he was a big dude, big tall dude. He was mad big. And I shook him. I took him in the building, made him jump up and down, see if he had change in his pocket. I could hear it, you know, little shit like that. And Lou was just looking at me like, yo, you taking that big nigga money? And from that day on, I really think that kind of sparked something because he really wasn't on that type of time then when we was young. It was more like I was. And, um, you know, it just reminded me of back then when we was little. Another situation, because, you know, people don't know. Like he said, he's a real jokester. Be like, he's a funny dude. You know, he liked to joke and crack jokes and have fun. So it was another time, though, we used to play hooky from school. Back then, remember, everybody used to go down to Times Square, but we used to sneak in the movies. And I was the Karate specialist. Flicks, baby. Yeah, what? I was a specialist. We'd get some weed, go downtown, sneak in the go movies. Go to Chinese restaurant. Yeah. So Karate one time, we go up on this joint. We had to go across the roof 
to sneak in, right? This nigga, <laughs> B, I'm all lead the way. I'm like, yo, come on, it's this way. I'm showing them how to get there, right? I opens the door that goes out on the roof <laughs> and three big ass dogs, they put these dogs up there this day because I guess they got tired of people. I don't know. Yo, these three big ass dogs just jumped out and jump on me, right? So I'm like, oh shit, I try to go back out the door. This nigga slammed the door and I was stuck <laughs> on the roof with the dogs. Me, I'm like, yo, what the fuck? Why did I, yo, see laughing, but yo, I wanted to kill this nigga. Yo, I'm just glad the dogs was mutts because I kind of stood there, you know what I mean? And they just jumped on me and shit. He waiting to hear them niggas <laughs> shake me and shit, but they just jumped on me and was playing. I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, yo, open the door. Let me in, B. He was like, <laughs> It took him a minute, but then he let me in. I'm like, yo, what the fuck is you doing? Why you, why y'all close the door? So he's just a funny, funny dude. Like we got mad history like that. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, like I said, a lot of people, you know, they look at him as this type of, you know, non-approachable or this guy that's just so threatening and frightening. But if you know him, like a lot of people might not get to know him like that. I'm quite sure dudes that he was in prison with, spent a lot of time with under them conditions. If you ever did and you got to know him, you would know he's one of the best friends you can have. Like he really go all and beyond. He go all out for you as a friend. When I did my first little time, nobody never sent me nothing. I'll never forget it. I did a year in Tryon, we was young. You know, that youth, that youth shit. Only dude sent me some sneakers was him. And that shit just stuck with me, you know what I mean? So when he did his bid, you know, I felt obligated to try to be there for him and shit. But it was a long stretch, you know what I mean? When you, look, when you lose a friendship or a friend to the system like that, and they facing all this time, I'm like, damn, I'm hearing he getting life death penalties and all this shit. And I'm just thinking, damn, I might not never see my man again. You know what I mean? But um, it was just a blessing how things turned out, you know? And I just want to also say this too, to everybody in Harlem, everybody everywhere, that my man might have harmed or did whatever to. We was young. We all was young. We all did shit when we was young that we wouldn't do today. You know what I mean? And I just want to state the fact that my man, he did his time. He served his time for a lot of that shit. All that shit he did, sat in that prison, in the hole, dealing with them situations for years and years and years, bro. He deserve a fresh start. And I'm just so proud of my bro. You know, because, you know, I told him before he came home, if you come home on that bullshit, I'm not going to fuck with you. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just on some different shit. We not doing that. And he surprised me, B. He came home. I've had incidents recently, and I'm like, ah, I might have to, you know, get on my bag. And I talked to my bro. I had to get his advice. And you'd be surprised, bro. He, he said the opposite of what I thought he would have said. He told me, you can't do that, bro. You're going to wind up in jail. They're going to throw this over. You got to figure this shit out. It's another way. You ain't got to prove nothing to nobody. Them days is over. Like, I needed that, bro. And I'm just, like, so honored to have my bro there to tell me the right thing. Not just, you know what I'm saying? Because that's the change. That's the process of his evolution. Right. He evolved. And he's such a better man now to the day. Like, when I sat here and heard him say dudes that told on him. And, like, I'm still on my sh I don't fuck with him. He's a rat. I don't like being around him. You know what I mean? That's one of the codes we always carry. We don't like that shit. Nobody do really. But when I sit with my bro and he like, yo, niggas told they did what they had to do. I'm, I'm not even, you know what I mean? I'm just moving on with my life right now. So I just want everybody to know my brother changed for the better. He evolved and he became much more of a legend. You know what I'm saying? Facts, a that's real right. legend now. You know, it takes a man to experience certain things to make him a real legend. Like, you can't just say, you know, say that you're a legend 
and you ain't do nothing to earn them stripes. If you I mean, did, you don't say it. Homie, I've been out here, and I thank, I thank God and Allah that I've been blessed. I didn't have to do all that time. I didn't do all that time. I've been out here all my life mostly. I might have served a year or two here and there, like when I was in the youth or whatever, but I've been fortunate. But being, you know, out here, all my homies that went to jail used to come back and tell me all these stories about my man. And I'm like, I'm saying to myself, you know, you don't hear too much about dudes when they go to jail. A lot of dudes are strong in the streets, and then when they go to jail, they not strong. Facts, that's right. Yo, my man was stronger in the jails than I think he was in the streets. Because every time somebody came from the penitentiary, they talking about Lou. So that's like, he don't like talking about himself. You know, he the type of brother, he humble. And it's always best to let somebody else tell a story so it don't seem like you fronting, you bragging, you know, shit like that. I mean, I've heard so many stories from jail to jail to jail. Dudes done came home and told me how four, five niggas ran up on you in the yard and they tried to bang on you. You was by yourself. And they told me Lou ran through all of them, like by himself, just smashing. You know what I'm talking about? That situation? Yeah. You know? Where'd that happen? In, uh, in Otisville. Oh, that's the Otisville yeah. incident. Yeah, that's the Otisville incident. So, so, so what, why, one, what, what brought that on? Why they even? One of my co-defendants had a fight with, one, with a Latin king in MCC. And uh, it, when it came back off the bus, they was like, yo, who's, the, who's these dudes, the lynch mob? My mama was, was two lynch mob, the, the Willis lynch mobs and, it was, and, uh, and us. And they was basically saying, yo, well, so I walked up to one of them. I was like, well, anyway, they, they were saying, yo, we was waiting for word to get back. So I'm like, waiting for word to get back? What you mean by that? Well, we waiting for the head dude to tell us what to, what to do, what happened to MCC. I was like, yeah, all right. So when I get to the gym, you know what I'm saying? You know, I, we, I'm talking to the homies, but we had a game that day. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, you know, because we had all the ball players, New York playing Brooklyn and shit like that. So, you know, but we had, you know, good ball players, Bob, Kev, and all us, we playing ball. But what happened was we had a we had one of the homies from St. Nick, the garage boy, or Fred, he come to me and said, Joe Lou, the Latin Kings and the um and the Mieta is having a meeting in the in the equipment room. So I remind you in the equipment room, they got all the all the stuff in there. So I'm like, what? I'm saying they having a meeting. So when I look, I seen they was in there. So I said, Joe. So I sat down by the weight, because the weights is right by the door. I said, Joe, I'm gonna take one of these 25s. I'm gonna wear, wear one of these niggas out. But I thought about that. I was like, man, I'm not, man, fuck these niggas. I don't care about. It. So when they can't, when I when I when I say that to myself, they coming out. I'm like, yo. I know y'all niggas ain't have no meeting about no that shit that happened to MCC, but what threw me off was the dude. The dude said, "Yo, nah, Lou, what happened to MCC?" That's what threw me off because if he would have just said, you know, whatever, that we probably could have talked. But when he said, "What happened to MCC?" so that threw me off because I'm saying the whole compound knew about it. So I just start hooking, you know, what I'm trying to say. So I start hooking, but the crazy stuff. When I just seen they was falling so easy, I was like, oh shit. So I was like, <laughs> first thing I started saying to myself, I was like, damn, this weight and this pull up must be must be paying off. You know, <laughs> these niggas falling so easy. But, you know, we had the homeboys come. So anyway, I get to make it back to the to the unit, you know, before they call a lockdown. And then when I get back to the to the unit, and you know, I'm able to tell this because he the dude was a rat anyway. This dude named Letchy, I wound up stabbing him in the cell. But he when he when when they locked all of us up, he used that as an excuse to tell on the Latin King case. And he went to court and was like, yo, this would happen when you when you're a gang member. So I guess him being getting stabbed and he, that was able for him to go into the hole and that was able for him to separate himself and tell on the case. You know what I'm saying? Because they even used that in my case. You know what I'm saying? They use everything in my case, you know what I'm saying? Just like just like you asked about Pope. One day, me and him is in the um, we was in uh we was in a hole together, and I seen the CO taking the wreck, and I was like, yo, I was like, yo, the CO name was Smith. I was like, yo, Smith, yo, let me go to let me go to court, let me go to uh let me go to wreck with that nigga Pope, man, so I can put some holes in him. But yo, I'm bullshitting <laughs> playing, right? 
But come to find out, they put that shit. All this shit is public shit. In my in my records, they use that shit in my court, in my case, and everything. Yeah, yeah. He went he went straight to the prosecutor. Told him like, yeah. He told him why he was wanting to stab me when I was going to wreck. They they had I had a hearing on it with a uh the CEO had to come and be on the stand with me right there and testify like yeah he did that I said that yeah yeah. Just for me to have a requested jury, so you know that's how that federal system is. You know they they real they try to get everything out of the rats. You know what I'm saying? The rats try to use everything to get they. You know what I'm saying? And they got the whole system at their at their back. You know. You said that they sequestered your uh, they sequestered your jury. Right. Explain people the difference between a regular jury and a sequestered jury. A requested jury is basically like where they put them up in a hotel, so nobody can get to them. Or and they don't let them watch no news or nothing. Well, the news they they try to say that they can't watch no news, but you know they gonna watch news in the hotel. But they try to put them up and make that's what make your cake make them look at you as you know a real threat to society because they saying that we got to be in a hotel for somebody to do something to us, then he must be a real threat. So that that's what they do when they get a request to jury. That's right. That's right. A lot of cats look at those kinds of things being said about different people in the newspaper, whatever, whatever, young cats moving around and they have delusions of grandeur. Be like, yeah, that's they're going to have to sequester my fucking jury, nigga. I'm a, and not understanding what yes. the implications of that are. You could be innocent of your shit, but if they present you like that, yeah. then that's the people, the they don't know the yeah. difference. It look to them like you dangerous. Mm hmm. You know, so be careful what you wish for, young hustlers. Yeah, that's a they fact. They got a place for you. That's a fact. And, yeah. and and coming from Harlem, you know, where we came from, the way we grew up, you know, Lou was right. You know, we grew up under different circumstances. I mean, we might have could have went to school, became doctors, lawyers and all that. But we ain't have nobody in our neighborhood that set examples for us that we could look at him and say, I'm going to be like him. I'm going to follow that route. You know what we had, homie? We had gangsters on our blocks. We had drug dealers. I'll never forget growing up saying, I want to be like Nicky fucking Barnes, besides the rat shit. When he was on the cover of the Time magazine and all that shit. Mr. Untouchable. And just was getting so much money. That's what I glorified. That's what I, oh, I said to myself one day at a young age, B, I was like, yo, I want to be like that but I don't want to ever have to face what he had to face because now he got locked up. He was going to jail forever. And I was like, damn, that's a hell of a decision. You know, at a young age, I, I'll never forget thinking this shit to myself, like scared, scared to myself within myself because I knew that's what I wanted to be. That's all that was around me. I come from a family, six boys, three girls. And you had what? Two. How many brothers? Four girls, six boys. Right. So we both come from big families. My older two brothers, God bless the dead, Johnny, Mo, and Ronnie, they passed away. But they was in the drugs and all that shit too, in and out of jail. So he come home from jail, teaching me how to fight, punching on me. You got to be tough, nigga. Woo, woo, woo. I'm like, when I get old, I'm going to fuck you up. Right. Because he beating on me all, like, they really used to install that shit in us, though. I know exactly you know what, what you I mean? mean. Like, but they and, were preparing you for the world that they figured was always going to be, world you had to be prepared for. And that's exactly the role that we chose. I know I did, too. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we had that type of experience and them type of influences. influence exactly to look at. But at the same token, it taught us a lot about being a man, a lot about being honorable, loyal to your friends and you know we dealt with a lot of backstabbing situations and everything was all about money you know and drugs i remember experiencing and attention yeah like two two of the older brothers i used to look up to and um one of them killed their best friend and when i was young i looked at it and said joe how could he kill his best friend like how could they used to be so cool. I didn't understand it at this young age. And it always bothered me. It bothered me to the point when I got older, it taught me don't trust nobody. No matter who your left and right hand man is. You know what I'm saying? 
This is true. This yeah. is the hard thing that yeah. comes from having the experiences that we have developmentally coming out of our community. If you're watching, if you're paying attention, then you understand that that's the reality of it. You dig? Yeah. And like the situations that happen with Lou, look at, look at the, the most harm was done by the people who were closest to him that he never suspected would ever you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's the reality of it. That's what people are choosing when they're choosing them streets. And we all were like that when we were young. We picking people based upon our common uh, interests, you know, our common circumstances. And we think that because we are affected by our situations the way we are and they, and they instill ethics and morals in us and honor becomes a, a, a paramount thing we thinking that they're being impacted by those influences in the same way, but they're not. For them, it's, it's making them feel inadequate or afraid or unstable. And the things they're doing that we're doing, they're doing it for a different reason. But we get mm -hmm. under the impression that they're doing it for the same reason we're doing it for. Thus, they're like us. Thus, they would do anything else we would do under any other circumstance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people fall for that. It's cats right now that are standing next to the guy that's going to either put a bullet in the back of their head for, for all of the money or that's going to line them up with the police and send them away for the rest of their lives where they'll never be able to actually make physical contact with their with their loved ones again. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a fact. And you got to also understand, too, like we grew up in an age where it wasn't no rats. It wasn't no snitching. Nicky Barnes was the first snitch that really brought down the whole organization. If you do the history- And documented, yes. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta know the history of this drug game. You know what I mean? And that's the thing, we lived through that shit. Giuliani, when he was a DA, I'll never forget, he came to Hunt 16th Street and the big dope thing with the big hands, what Claw. his name was? Claw, yeah. Mm -hmm. Claw told a Claw. nigga, he was out there with the DA and some other, some other people, right? White dudes, and they, you know, only time you seen white people in Harlem was when they was buying drugs. I'm dead serious. That's a fact. Like, it was a time you seen white people, you know they was buying drugs or they was the police. He told the white dude, the DA and, and Giuliani, he said, yo, I don't give a fuck who you is. Because Giuliani's like, yo, you know who we is? <laughs> nigga told him, I don't give a fuck who you is. If you ain't buying no motherfucking drugs, you got to get the fuck up out. And that's I, I when Giuliani that. went in on us. <laughs> That nigga had a whole personal beef to, right. to conquer all that shit in Harlem. He wanted everybody done. So like the Nicky Bond shit was the beginning of the snitch. Because if you remember, if you ever look at any newspapers or tabloids or whatever, check the history, Nicky Bonds, they wanted to give him life. Giuliani said, no, let's give him a deal. They gave him the deal 25, 30 years or whatever. And most people was like, nah, he's supposed to go away forever. And Giuliani ain't told him, he said, look, we would never know nothing about what's going on in Harlem. They didn't know how much money was being made in Harlem, bro. No, they knew. They knew. They, they didn't they had, they had they cats didn't they know, had, that had come before. Uh, they didn't know we was paying off precincts. Police was being paid millions. See, let me just, I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is what it is, right? The politicians in, in our neighborhood, city councils, Charles Rangel, Percy mm -hmm. Sutton, mm -hmm. even Reverend Bunce. Listen to what I'm saying. All of them knew this from the 60s, what was going to go on. You know what I'm trying to say? When I say this, because they knew what the hair on era brung, me and theirs, within a month, six months, whatever, brung me and theirs. Mm -hmm. But what they did, we had a bunch of condemned buildings and you know storefronts. Mm -hmm. They sold them to them for a dollar. They know automatically they're going to fix them up. You know what I'm trying to say? But what they didn't tell us is that when you get caught, it's coming back to us. You know what I'm trying to say? So mm -hmm. what they did is they used their influence to have us buy up, fix up the community, but they, they took over. So now all this was in the plan. You know what I'm trying to say? So now once they fix up Harlem, it was, a, it was a plan for them to sell it to the corporations and move us out of Harlem. You know what I'm trying to say? And all this came up recently That's with Charles did. Rangel when he tried to get the Apollo. They tried to build a, a building with the Apollo, take the Apollo out, mm -hmm. right? And put 
the Apollo back in the building. They was like, nah, that's a monument. So when everybody protests on that, because you got to remember, they already took malls and pop stores and talking about your, you know what I'm saying, we're going to take it because you'll not generate enough revenue to hire the kids and all that. So they done done all that, generations. So now they try to do that. So now when everybody start beefing about this Apollo thing, Charles Rango go on the fire. You know what I'm trying to say? They come to find out that he's in, he's in uh, what's that, Linux Terrace. He done built in two built apartments. Only place that sell Chris Taylor is the thing down there, and the only person that buys is him. You know what I'm saying? So now they investigate him. They see all this happening. You know mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. So now they what they do, they boot him out for a year or two, but right where he at now, he back in the same position. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Because he did so much mm-hmm. for them, you know, for Harlem. So. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You can't, you, you, I understand where you're going with it, but it was really the politicians that the ones that we supposed to be looking up to, mm. you know what I'm trying to say, and building a better community for us. Mm-hmm. What they did, they really took Harlem from us. It wouldn't be no, this, everything was black owned. You got to remember when we was young, we went to the store. If you don't have enough to pay for it, you know what I'm trying to say? They'll let you go for a penny. Your moms and pops can go in there and buy groceries until they get their check. You can't do that now. There ain't no A-Rab's going to do that. You know what I'm trying to say? It was black owned, but they took that away from us. So we got to blame them politicians right now for that. You know what I'm trying to say? So right? now we are going to check the trying to do what we can do now for them. But you got to remember what they did back then. So, you know, I'm not going to say they all bad, but when we going to find a good one? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. When we going to find a good one? Oh, that that's that's a solid end right there. Yeah, yeah, Real that's talk. what I'm talking Real about. Talk, right? right there. That's what made us idolize dumb guys. Guy Fisher, shout out to Guy Home now, because he the one brought the Apollo, saved it, supposed to get that money. To and they did it. just what he just said. And just what mm-hmm. it is. Percy just what he just said. Took it I'm over glad right you brought that up. Mm-hmm. Just what he just said. And what's the other kid named Frank Lucas? Like when we was young, these was the guys getting all this money. So we looking at that shit like, yo. We want to get money like that when we get older, bro. And that's what made us the way we are. Like, people don't understand Harlem was the mecca of the drugs. The first stop was Harlem. When that drug, when the drug, the dope came, they was coming to Harlem. If you wanted some good dope, you come from North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, everywhere. Philly. To Harlem. Connecticut. They used to sell quarters Jersey. of dope. Yeah, like cheese. I mean, you see how Times Square is? That's how Hunt 16th Street used Eat to that, be, that's bro. Right. You that's would right. think a movie just let out or something. That joint was built like that from at least from 13th Street all the way to all 19th. Yeah. That's right. That's a and fact. And all every block was making almost a mill a and day. And that was that shit all, went all the way to Lenox Avenue. That's right. right. And that's what made us Harlemics the way we are. That's why we always want some fly shit, getting money. Like, you know, a lot of trends were set from Harlem. That's like right. now. We get skipped over. It's, it's somewhere else. You know, it's changing. Because that's how the cycle of life works. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's how we came up. And that's what we and we idolized that. And the real gangsters, the real stick-up kids. Like, it was really tough stick-up kids. Like, I came up under Vic. He came up under his brothers. You know? And it was just a time where, as a young man, we didn't have really heroes to look up to besides them. And I think that's what really made us choose that role. You know what I mean? Well, what's now is what we know, the fact that we're still here and our ability to bridge that gap, you know, Mm -hmm. because we have that history Mm -hmm. and we have the experience. And like Lou said too, he he, he tapped on some real serious shit, bro, because now we have opportunity to get money we got more black millionaires now than ever. Ever since the Black Lives Matter big movement came, they said, okay, we got to start empowering more blacks. We need more black millionaires. We got a lot of the racial discrimination has been, you know, cut down some. They ain't stopped, mm-hmm. but they cut it down some. Remember we used to go to banks? They would never give us a loan, no matter how good our credentials was. You know what I mean? That was just the process. The banks, everybody knew it. Now it's different. Now we could go to the bank, build our credit, and do all that shit. It's all you about information. Saying? Yeah, so. All about information. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, gentlemen. Thank you, Danny, for uh, jumping mm-hmm. in with us, brother. That's and a uh, fact. You know, I look forward to uh, getting you in that chair and uh, talking about the things that you've been experienced and how you've leveraged that experience to do all the extraordinary things you're doing and have done. I know that you have honor up 
the first film out. And uh, I know that you are probably in post-production now with Honor Up 2, correct? Yeah, yeah. Right, we're so. about to start working on Honor Up 2, and we're about to start doing Paid in Full 2 as well. You Matter of fact, I mean? we, got a, uh, we got a video shoot tomorrow. Yeah. At like, what, 3 o'clock? Yeah, we're about to start shooting for Paid in Full 2. Excellent. So, you know, I just want to give a shout out to some of the real brothers in Harlem, man. Like, you got a lot of real brothers, man, that really respect brothers and they really respect honorable men. You know what I mean? Jewel, Dane, like people don't know that's what helped Dane get home. I mean, helped him get home. The fact that when he had the death penalty, he ran out of his little bread that he made in the streets. But brothers like Jewel and his brother, Dane, they put up some money and that shit kind of helped him get off that death penalty. And he wound up doing, getting the 30 years or whatever, whatever. So that saved his life. So I just want to say shout out to the real honorable brothers like that, man, that helped out, that stood by, you know, some real honorable men. And um, a lot of the rappers and people that's making it actors out of Harlem, you know, y'all should give back to the community, just like my man said. Y'all take your money, y'all move away. Everybody act like they scared to come back to the hood. This is where we from, bro. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like helping another little you. That's right. Like nobody got a better vision of seeing somebody like yourself but you. It's true. You can look at these young men. Some of these young men is so strong right now. Mind powerful, strong black young men. All they need is a little guidance. That's it. And I think that's what me and him had, our brothers, you know, we had an older generation that kind of guided us, you know, and led the way. And the other OGs that's out there, we got to stop turning our back on the youth. We got to start, you know, trying to give back, try to make a difference. Like I said, we not young no more. I, I think way different than I did back then. When you're a man, you come 50, 45 and all that, it's a different experience from when you're 20, 30. You see things different. You ready to die in the streets. You ready to kill and go to jail, but you just don't have no idea what's in store for you because nobody is setting them type examples or telling you, like you just got to stick with the process. So I want to salute you too, bro, for having us on the show. You know, definitely for giving my brother an outlet to, you know, talk about his story because it's a story that should be told and everybody need to know what real honorable men look like. That's right. You know and what, what it takes, if you're gonna take that chance, if oh, you're yeah. gonna make that choice, what you have to be prepared yeah. to endure. That's a fact, man. Because the glory story is over. That's if a fact. when the sun don't shine, you start telling on people. Nah, listen, bro. That's, that means everything you did before that wasn't the truth, before, and that's your truth. Before I get off this joint, me and Lou, we talk about this shit sometime, and I hear other brothers that did a lot of time talk about it. A lot of you young brothers quick to pop your gun and pull the trigger. Y'all know it's mad snitches out here now. You're not getting away with that shit for long. And besides the snitches, they got cameras everywhere now. But my point is just to say, he experienced a lot of young brothers coming into jail, facing that time and just like, I can't do this shit, this type of pressure. Some dudes can do the time. Some, t some dudes, the time do them. They hang themselves. They they turn into all type of shit in there. They don't be the same. Ride the med line. What? They shit on themselves and rub it on the walls. They be bugging out. Indeed. Because they minds be fucked up. So we just want y'all to know, man, be careful with all that trying to be tough and gangster shoot. Like, it's cool to be tough, but be honorable with it. Shoot when it's time to shoot. It's, if it's a time, we respect that. But the unnecessary, just killing for a name and a reputation, it's going to put you in a place you ain't going to want to be, bro, for many, many years, man. And that shit is hard. So, you know, like I said, thank you, brother, for having us on the show, man. We appreciate you, man. Absolutely, my brother. Keep it's up the good have work, you. man. Hey, can't stop, won't stop. And yeah. uh, shout out to uh, Jules having my brother Lou on the cover of the New Felon magazine. Yeah, shout out to, shout out to yeah. the brother Jules for having um, the homie on the, the cover of the New uh, Magazine, the new issue of Felon Magazine. That's right. So get that copy of that you know, yeah. New Felon Magazine at Lou Sims on the cover. And of course, you know what I'm saying? He's going to let you know what it is. Mm-hmm. So who was Bootney, bro? 
Booby, when I was like a childhood friend, we came, we grew up from, um, as I spoke to you earlier about him, we grew up, we went to uh, public school together. You know, we started committing crimes together, you know, and then uh, as we grew, as we grew older, you know what I'm saying? They was they they were they they labeled me as his protector. But I, I can I can recall one time, it was this dude named Anthony, named Ant from uh, 34th Street, and he used to always try to rob Bootney and take his money as well as others. And uh, I remember I had on a, a pair of powder blue uh, beaters with the uh, members only sw- sweatsuits back then, and he had on the rust British color. Walkers for those who British don't know. Walkers, yeah, British Walkers with the uh, members only. He had the rust color. I had the blue color. And um, I remember he tried to t- take his money, and I remember me and Ann fighting for hours. And I remember looking at my British walkers because they had footprints on them. I was mad in the mud. I'm like, oh, man, so that even made me fight harder. But, um, you know, me and him grew up, he was, he was more like on, he started out like on some pickpocketing stuff, but I wasn't, I was more, Just you know what I'm saying, into the, the drug scene. So, you know, we started hustling for my brother as, as well as we, you know what I'm saying, I, he used to come around when we was robbing people in front of the schools, supermarkets and stuff like that, going back, taking, you know, people that was robbing, uh, packing bags, money and everything. But Bootney, he was like, like I said, he was like a, a, a character witness on my case because he went way back to 1976 oh, on our that's case. Who that one. And then he told everything up to the day, like every little thing, you know what I'm trying to say? Even the shit like... When I used to visit him in jail, I used to bring him, you know, bring girls with me to bring him drugs and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Because, like I said, this is my man. You know what I'm trying to say? We grew up together, but it's a whole lot of stuff that I found out that you know when he when he told him, I couldn't believe that from the from the beginning because I'm like, damn, you know. So that's who Bootney is. What? I mean, you 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 know you never know what's inside another man's head or or heart, right? except through the actions that they display or whatever. But if you could just for a moment, somebody you knew that long. Well, I think- already knew from I already knew from us growing up, he wasn't a tough guy, but he was my man. You know what I'm trying to say? So, you know, you know what I'm saying? A lot of things we did, like, you know what I'm saying? Even bullshit robberies, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I remember we used to play, uh, we used to play, we, we used to call this thing, like, they started out pickpocket, but we used to call it the snatch and grab Tom and Jerry, you know what I'm trying to say? Mm-hmm. You you know, you, when I snatch it, you you know what I'm saying, Tom and Jerry, you, I'm running behind you. So, like, when cabs, like, in the summertime, when the cabs would come, I'd talk to you, I'd talk to the cab on one side, he had a cigar box in the, in the middle, he had snatched that, Tom and Jerry, we off, we running, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's a whole lot of stuff that me and him used to do, like, we used to stay up late at, you know, late up late and just wait for the newspapers and do, we used to do all kind of crimes back then, you know what I'm saying? Selling loose joints, Avenue America. Like if they wasn't selling in the pool room, we'd go down to Avenue, Avenue America. So lunch break, Avenue of America, yep. you know, and uh, uh, they, you know, all the uh, people that go on lunch break, they want to smoke a weed. So we had the small bamboo for a dollar, the long bamboo for a dollar fifty. So, you know what I'm saying? We used to go down there and kill them. We could sell a hundred joints down there within the, within that time. This is like you know 77, 78? Yeah, like 77, 78. Mm-hmm. Everybody was doing that. Yeah. That's crazy. The thing about it, I still got photos from back then in front of, in front of AJ Lester's and I got all kind of, I got all kind of photos back because, you know, I was a photo I always been like that, like to take photos. So I got us in front of AJ Lester's when all the outfits we used to buy, you know what I'm saying? When we was kids. Overlaps. I got kids, I got pictures when I was from, from 79, 78 and stuff like that, you know? So you got overlaps and, and uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. double yeah. knits and. So you gotta remember, like, you know, like I said, my brothers and them, they had to buy me clothes. Like, you know, I never shopped in, in kids' stores. You know what I'm saying? Because of them. They didn't ever have time. Like, yo, we going to go down to this kid's store and buy you not. Nah, it's either going to get it off the van and we're going to get a tailor for you or you ain't going to get nothing. So, like, when they go to AJ, I have I get a pair. I get the smallest size pants get and then my pockets be touching in the back. You know what I'm saying? They'll take me in the store and give me a pair of British walkers even though I wore a five, the smallest right size door. was a six. I got to throw some tissue on. I wear a bunch of socks and put them on. So, I, I always had... Adult clothes, that's why people looked at, yo, damn, he he fly, but at the same time, they was always, like, even a small mark neck, I had to get that snitched up, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, 
You know, they never took me to stores like that. The only one that took me to stores like that was my sister Ruby because she had kids my her age. Mm -hmm. But you got to remember, that was a, those were her kids. So I had to fend for myself as a kid. So I was more in the street, more way ahead of time. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I started the street. It ain't like, you know what I'm saying? My brother just going to be like, yo, here this, this, that. You know, they'll, they'll buy me back to school, clothes, summer clothes, a birthday or something like that. But at the same time, my day-to-day -day shit, I had to fend for myself. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I had a brother named Smoke. He taught me the ropes of all that. Even though he was on heroin, he still was fly and had all the baddest girls. Like if you if you if a, if a person would talk about it, he was like, yo, I remember he had the baddest girl in this block and this block. You know what I'm saying? You know he taught me the whole ropes of selling drugs. Period. You know what I'm saying? How to cut it? How to? You know what I'm trying to say? You know? Yeah, indeed. Um, you talked about the the robberies early on. That was kind of something that was attached to the whole. Uh, standard operation procedure for uh, uh, for lynch mob, um, according to the report. So, y'all were, you know, getting money on on the, on the drug side, but y'all were also, uh, according to reports, uh, doing robberies. Maybe might put a press game on some cat. You know what I'm saying? Uh, maybe it might take a ticket, push a button. You know what I mean? So how it, it, it was that part of the lynch mob criteria? Like well, I will tell you like this, you know, drugs was the main that was the was the was the main thing that we was into, but you know what I'm trying to say? It's like every day it's a different every day you came out, if it, if it's a hustle that that can be hustled, you're gonna hustle it. Even if it's stealing bread off the bread truck, you know what I'm trying to say? We're gonna hustle it, you know what I'm saying? So that's basically what that what that is, you know what I'm trying to say. I'm not gonna turn down on hustle. Because I used to come out to my house when I lived in Jersey with just bridge money and go back with money, you know what I'm trying to say, in my pocket. That was that was that was my main thing. I didn't gamble, I didn't smoke weed, I didn't do nothing, you know what I'm trying to say. And I barely drunk, I barely drink now, you know what I'm saying. So that was barely my hustle. So that was my high, you know what I'm saying. To get home and I say, okay, this is what I got here, you know what I mean. I left with the left with pockets right. low, I'm back you know? with pockets high. That's right. Right. So you know, like. That was my thing right there. So, and even up to the day, I'm, a, I'm not, like I said, I'm not bragging on it, you know what I'm trying to say, but, you know, I wasn't really into the jury and all that other stuff and fur coats. I used to think like a lot of that was for females, but even though I had a couple of pieces and stuff like that. But, you know, my main thing was like, you know, like I said, end of the day, going home with some money, you know what I'm trying to say? And whoever I was with, a female that I was with, you know what I'm trying to say? That's, that's she was going to get spoiled off the top. You know what I'm trying to say? Because right. she got to represent it. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, the first time I bought a female in the car, she had a BM. You know what I'm trying to say? It was a 325, but you got to remember, a lot of niggas in the street wasn't driving them cars at that time. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it is. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not bragging on it, but you're like, you know what I'm saying? That comes with the territory. If you get that type of money, that's what you give it. That's what, you know what I'm saying, you get. And that's what she deserved if she representing you at, that, at the end of the day, you know? When it when it came to a robbery or extortion tar target, like how was that? How was that picked? How was the cat picked for? Man, I mean, you know, uh, it always it always got something to do with like you know what I'm trying to say. You know, I can't really explain it. Like you know, what I'm saying sometimes it works its way into it. Just you know, what I'm saying sometimes a person just leads itself into that. You know, what I'm trying to say leads itself into certain debts. You know, what I'm trying so. to say like I say like you know, like. You know, a man probably a man probably owe Leon some money for this. You know what I'm trying to say? And it's it's, it's been a few properties that we got through owing people people owing the money. Like you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into details and say who it is because I don't want to put that person on blast because I'm gonna save that for another date. But at the same time, I remember one time we had to take a barber shop and a game room. You know what I'm trying to say? So that was it. You know what I'm trying to say? And I you know as me as as him owing the money, I was like, yo, then this is ours, right? You know what I'm trying to say? And I got locked up doing 91 when Puff gave the, the uh, basketball joint up there for taking a car that somebody owed us some money. You know what I'm trying to say? I took his car and was riding up and down the avenue. Next thing I know, I go to stop to talk to Leon. The police came from everywhere. The dude done told on me about the car. So I get <laughs> locked up for that. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, you know, so certain shit like that comes into play. You know what I'm trying to say? And then, you know, you got other, you got other dudes that... That's they that's they main thing, you know what I'm trying to say, the the extortion things or stuff like that, you know what I'm trying to say? And that brings us head that brings us to bump heads, to, you know what I'm trying to say, 
on a certain thing. Like I said, I'm not going to mention no names and all that shit right there. I'm going to say that for another date, but that brought us to bump heads. You know what I'm trying to say? Where other people fear them purpose people, but, you know, at this same time, yo, look, I'm not stepping on your toes and don't step on mine. I'm going to respect you over here, respect over here, but that brought us to bump heads. You know what I'm trying to say to it? That shit had to come to a head. Right. You know, so... And did did it come to a head at that yeah, point? Yeah, it came to a head, but at the same time, though, you know, I guess the I guess the head of the snake, the two heads of the snake wasn't chopped off, so they, you know, we still we still here to tell our story. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Indeed. You know? Um, who is Anthony Pope? Well, he was he was another one of the person I grew up. I'm not from I'm not people think I'm from uptown. I went to school uptown. And I always hustled all 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 over the all over Harlem and the Bronx. Whether it came from hustling in the Bronx with my sister, you know, I said I hustled in Featherbed, 183rd, College Avenue, all that shit up there. Cozy Corner. I hustled all the way up there. But at the same time, that's when I was a kid. But I'm from downtown. I grew up uptown. I, you know, threw up like St. Nick. I hustled all over Harlem too. But at the same time, I grew up uptown from going to school. I you hung say out with downtown. Dudes, but I'm who... from 12th Street. You know what I'm trying to say? So Pope was from 11th Street. West Side. Nah, yeah, the West Side. Yeah, the West Side. He's from my neighborhood. Yeah. And like, you know, we grew up, like I said, a lot of people I always hung out with was always older than me. And he had me by like two or three years. And as we grew up, you know what I'm saying? One of the main incidents that I can say. That uh that happened with him is that uh he had got into he uh some dudes some dudes that was that was Bogard and that was running the neighborhood on some Bogard shit extortion back then had robbed him I'm I'm talking about without a gun put him to sleep you know and mind you he was always big for his age you know what I'm saying so he was looking like an adult when we was like 15 16 but they had put him to sleep. And shit, and I remember I come to the block because I had always had me and me and my brother Smoke had always had 13th Street, so I come to the block, and uh, I see him by the schoolyard with a few dudes from the from the neighborhood, and he crying. I'm talking about snot coming out his nose and everything. I'm like, yo, what the fuck happened? So when he tells me, I'm like, oh yeah. So you know, at first I ain't want to get into it, but I want to tell the dudes that robbed him. I'm like, yo, look, you know that Smoke money, blah blah blah. So they wind up giving some of the money back. You know, I'm trying to say on the strength. Smoke was your older brother. Right, my older brother. So they wound up giving some of the money back. But me and him was always cool. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know where all this stuff stuff came. Like, after we came from doing our state bid, you know what I'm trying to say? But, you know, I always looked out for him when he was in jail. You know what I'm saying? Like, one that was one of the main things I did when I came home in 88. I went to see everybody or, or whoever was in contact with me. I made sure they was all right. Like, yo, here go your girl. I'm going to send your girl to me. And I got this for you. You know what I'm trying to say? And one thing about it, people can say a lot of bad things about me, but I never left nobody in jail. I paid that bail money. You know what I'm trying to say? So I, I got to I got to say that, you know? And I'm like, like, like I'm sitting here and I'm telling y'all this story. Like I said, I'm not one to tell stories. I'd rather for another person to tell it. But I'm but uh, pretty soon. These these people gonna have to come out and collaborate these stories, you know what I'm saying? Certain things like that. So they ain't always gotta think that I'm a bad guy. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know? Right. It's like I sad. said, I stay on joke time. Right. You know what Indeed. I'm saying? No doubt. <laughs> Did the government ever offer you a uh, a deal? Nah. That's one of the things that uh that detective said on the um on the uh like, you know, when you first come in, the, the when you first get arrested, the arrest is Officers and all that shit, they try to lead you into something like that and everything like that. You know what I'm trying to say? But Jay Ma, he said on the stand, you know what I'm saying? Because every time I got arrested in the in the state, you know what I'm trying to say? They always try to get you to sign the waivers or all that stuff to waive your rights or all that, whatever like that. But he said on the stand, he said, Joe, you know, Griffin was non-approachable when it came to certain things because he'd get arrested and he'd be in the bullpen quiet. Even when I put him in the lineup, he'd try to hold his head down. All this is a, all this is, is a, the on record. You know what I'm saying? He'd hold his head down like he ain't want to be for somebody to pick him up at a lineup without his lawyer being there. So it's like he knew off the top what was, you know what I'm saying, what to say and what to do. You know what I'm trying to say? So he said that because one of my co-defendants that was arrested with us, he he was telling from the street. You know what I'm trying to say? Meaning that he was telling, when I say he was telling from the street, th he was getting arrested and we not understanding, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Even a little bullshit, he was getting out. You know what I'm trying to say? You know? No bail, no. No bail, no nothing. You know what I'm saying? But then we found out when he got, when he, we got arrested 
the, um, Jay Ma was like saying like, yo, we ain't worrying about we ain't worrying about this person because he was saying that we ain't worrying about the case because we already got one that's telling. And we was like, who the fuck is it? You know what I'm saying? But yet, yet no, he's still going to court with us. But then we found out when he stopped going that he was telling from the street. So he always had somebody that was telling on the case. So that's like so that's, before y'all were taken off the street, right? So when I when I look at it, I was like, when I watched these mob stories, I was like, God damn, I would have never thought this is the man there that my case was gonna be a mob case where I'm gonna be faced with a Rico charged with the mob, been charged with, or I'm gonna have an inside man, you know what I'm saying, telling us, telling them, you know what I'm saying, telling straight our daily day operations and all what's going on and who's doing this and all this shit like this. But I'm glad he was an underhand, whereas I never did nothing, you know what I'm trying to say, outside of. You know what I'm saying? Discribbling drugs with him. You know what I'm saying? Anything else, I was like, man, damn. You know what I'm saying? You know? That's crazy. The game is dirty, dirty, man. It is what it is, man. Indeed. I mean, you know, it's probably even worse today. Oh, no doubt. There's a lot of people playing that's not qualified. You know? They're not qualified. They don't know what they're in for, but they do know they got an option that didn't exist for us like that. You know what I mean? Which is doing, going against the comrades and Whatever happens after that, they ultimately can come back to their, their community and be accepted. And if they're getting two dollars, they definitely gonna be accepted. Well, you see where I'm at, man. You know, regardless of what motherfuckers may say behind my back or behind my my my, my day one dudes, I'm with I'm with day one dudes that you know what I'm trying to say from junior high school and all that shit. That's who I be with now. You know what I'm saying? Those that stand up and been here. You know what I'm trying to say? Those that check for me, made sure I was good, doing my bit. You know what I'm trying to say? You know, that's who I'm with. You know, other than that, I don't try to. I don't try to have no new friends, no none of that. I'm good. You know. Uh, who was uh, Darnell Wells? Oh, I ain't. I ain't going into all that. You already know all that. We ain't going to none of that. So, if he telling you to feed off with that one, not we ain't going to none of that. That's for a later date. You and uh, so, uh, who was Sunday? Like I said, we ain't even got to go into none of that. You know what I'm saying? Right now, right now, I feel that you know, even you know, even though the questions, I don't know if the questions is put there by you or whoever. I'm feeling that that's a violation. You know, I'm trying to say uh, this interview right here because, like I said, certain things I'm not going to talk about. You know, I'm trying to say whether I was convicted of them or not. You know, I'm trying to say certain things y'all y'all privileged to know about. Certain things that y'all not privileged to know about. You know, I'm trying to say maybe like maybe y'all might hear about it in a later date. But yo, you know what I'm saying? Right now, nah, that ain't, we ain't doing that one. You Respect. know what I'm saying? Like I said, that's a violation. Respect. You know? Respect. Absolutely. Now I don't know if you were a, a, a part of this, but I know that uh, I, I I saw this article. I came across it last night online. That is in my former publication, Don Diva, and. Um, it's it's a it's an article about uh, gangbangers. The title is "Gangbangers Sue Magazine Over Story Detailing Their Exploits." Right. This is from July twenty eighth, uh, two thousand fifteen. It says four convicted Harlem gangbangers are suing a magazine that detailed the crack dealing and murders that got them busted in nineteen ninety five, according to their new federal defamation lawsuit. It says Don Diva and uh, Urban Lifestyle uh, Magazine ran a story last April. Uh, about the 142nd Street uh, lynch mob and how the gang made millions selling crack. Uh, it's a quote here. It says, punishment for challenging the 142nd Street lynch mob, controlling narcotics and all that, whatever, whatever you know, so swift and deadly. All right. So um, it says the four plaintiffs um, were members of the lynch mob um, and that uh, they wanted to sue Don Diva for their recounts. Uh, I think it was... Uh, uh, the one plaintiff was Derek Razor, uh, who they say here committed murder. Plaintiff Ralph Wallace carried 500 crack vials and used a 16-year-old teen as a human shield during a shooting. And plaintiff Edward Funches smuggled drugs between Alabama and the East Coast. Uh, you were not a part of this lawsuit. No. All right. Um, I read the article last night and... You were the person that was interviewed in that in that article. Right. So these guys who are mentioned here, what was their disposition in the case that they would take this position? Well, basically, I guess you said I, what you said. That's what it was. Basically, what happened was uh, Don D would just took whatever they knew of the case and put it in there. My story was based on Don D. If you read it, it would just be, you know, what I'm saying 
explaining my case, what I was locked up for, you know, trying to say, and uh, you know, my not even my part taking in the, in the case, just what I was locked up done for, and you know, certain other aspects of the case, but it never mentioned them or others that may have came along in that article. That was, I guess that was just Don Deva format of doing that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so their names came up in right. the article, yeah, right. but they didn't participate in it. But the public record that right. Don Deva, yeah, right. yeah, okay, okay. Have you, have you ever run into anybody who was caught in the line of fire of anything that transpired in the, in the process of you handling the business at any point? No, not at all. Um, now that you are here, here in this space, in this set, in this mindset, you've, you've had the opportunity to really look at your life sitting in, a, in, in those, uh, those cells, those isolation cells. A man is left with his own thoughts. The actions that a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, 19-year-old Lou took, how did 30-year-old or 35-year-old Lou look at those actions taken by the Lou of 15 years earlier? Well, even now, I realize that, you know what I'm saying, I was just a product of the street, you know what I'm trying to say, at a young age. I don't have a lot of opportunity that the youth have today, you know what I'm trying to say? Right now, you ain't got to sell drugs to get rich. There's so many other opportunities for you to get. You can sit down and write a book and just publish it yourself. You know what I'm saying? And then you got a lot of job opportunity that, that you know what I'm saying, you can take care of yourself. So I didn't have that one as growing up. Like I said, it was 10 of us. So we, we was all in the street, you know what I'm saying? You know, and, and you got to remember, it was still racism back then, more pronounced than it was today. So, you know, so when I say that to say that, you know, like I said, I, I don't have a lot of opportunities, but if I had, you know what I'm saying, maybe I would have changed, I would have, I would have changed and been something different than this. But like I said, I was just taking life for what it is. So you could take what I did, you know what I'm trying to say, amongst the street, amongst the extremes of what the average drug dealer was doing, you know what I'm trying to say? But nah, like I said, when I came home, I was trying to pay catch up. And so whatever I learned in the, in, the, in the penitentiary, along with what I learned from before that, that's what I was applying. You know what I'm saying? Whether it was dealing with whatever aspect that came along, in my daily, but I just say, like I said, as me being a product of that of of, of the '60s and coming into the '70s, you know what I'm trying to say. And both the crack the the crack era and the Heron era being destroying our people, you know what I'm trying to say. I didn't ever take notice of all that until until I sat down and really thought about it. That I like, damn, you know what I'm trying to say. And I realized I I destroyed a lot of more lives beyond that. But at the same time, like I said. If I can ask a lot to forgive me for that, you know what I'm trying to say? I'm forgiven for other whatever whatever may have whatever person may have wronged me. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not even mad at the person that told on me to regain his freedom. Nah, I'm not mad. You did what you had to do. You know what I'm trying to say? But at the same time, we're not gonna sit at no table and have no dinner together, you know what I mean? You know? All right. He has to live with what he dealt, what he's done. You know, uh that's a burden that nobody can carry for him. No punishment you can impose upon him, even death, is going to be as severe and impactful on him as what he has to deal with internally. When he looks in the mirror and says, do I meet the criteria of a man as I perceive it? You know what I mean? We create our own prisons. Right. You know, um, forgiveness is a it's, a it's a tremendous gift to give unto oneself, you know, and um, if you can't give it to yourself, it doesn't matter who forgives you. You know, you will carry that burden and it will impact you psychologically and physically and emotionally and spiritually. Well, I feel this way, you know, I've been judged since I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? Some people, the old people said I was going to make it to be this age, then it got this age, then I was another age and all that. And still up to the day, I'm still being judged. But I, you know what I'm trying to say? At the end of the day, I don't care. You can say what you want to say about me, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I'm still going to be me. Only one that could judge me is a law. That's the only one I'm trying to please. You know what I'm saying? I ain't got to please my kids, none of them. You know what I'm trying to say? Even though my love is severe for them, but I'm trying to please a lot. You know what I'm trying to say? You know? Indeed. Do you regret having interrupted so many lives? I think 
I personally think, I, I think I got a little more on the ball than average motherfucker. I personally think that that has been conveyed, but we're not dealing with people who can even touch our reality. You know what I mean? So, you're right, because you're right. A lot of people like, you know, even if this, even if this film right here touch a broader audience, you know what I'm trying to say, beyond the streets, you know what I'm saying? It will. You know, taxpaying, whether it be white, black, or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Nobody can never tell your story or never know what you was going through at that time. So we can sit here and you, I can tell you, yo, this dude is a good dude and all the rest of this stuff. You know what I'm trying to say? But at the end of the day, when somebody do something wrong and it got to be rectified, all that's good is go out the business, go out the, go out the window. You know what I'm trying to say? So I had a lot of that, yo, yo, this, this, this was a good dude. Why this, why this? Yo, look. You never know the other side of this. You know what I'm trying to say? So if had you known this, you would have corrected for him. You know what I'm trying to say? So this is the side that you didn't know. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of people, you know, don't understand the aspects of us being in the street. You know what I'm trying to say? Because we can sit here and say one thing, you know what I'm trying to say? And it's like, I take it upon this like this, you know what I'm trying to say? And, you know, I'm not going to pat myself on the, on the back and say I'm a good guy, but at the same time, you know what I'm trying to say, certain things may have happened, whereas, just put it in this aspect, if, 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 if you owe me some money, that's one thing if you can't pay me, you know what I'm trying to say, but if you can't pay me and you still doing you, you know what I'm saying, what you want me to do? I want my money, you know what I'm trying to say, so therefore, you know, you know, a lot of people don't understand the aspect of this this thing right here because if, when the government, you owe the government money, he come get your money, it's no complaint. You know what I'm trying to say? And we'll it's lock no your ass up if you don't Right. Pay. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I'm saying? So when you when the when the big gangsters come do something, there's, there's no complaint about nothing. You know what I'm saying? They go over there, they go over there and interfere with wars that they don't have nothing to do with it. Destroy lives, you know what I'm trying to say, and By then the try thousands. to put it back together on our taxpayer money. You know what I'm trying to say? But yet no. We still got homeless, you know what I'm trying to say? We still got roads that need to be fixed. We, 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 we don't even deal with our own. So how can Biden come in? Now, I'm, I'm not trying to put this on a political aspect, right? How can no, Biden come over here? Brother. Listen, how can Biden come in and send millions and billions of dollars over here to Ukraine, you know what I'm trying to say? And we got people over here that you could have built a whole, a whole projects to put them in. You know what I'm trying to say? And fed them with all that money right there. But we taxpayer money. You know, we taxpayer citizens. Why they couldn't feed everybody doing, Trump was the only one that, that went into the reserve and just bogart that money. You know what I'm trying to say? But we got money. They said we got money to last until 2050, 60s or something like that. And reserve, why? You know what I'm trying to say? Wow, you know what I'm trying to say? So I'm not trying to put this on a political aspect, but I'm just saying this to say this. You got the big gangsters that get away with shit and we, as little dudes, is trying to survive in the town as, you know, being a fucking... And I'm not blaming them. I'm not blaming my my downfall to my demise on them. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm just saying, look at it, the bigger picture. Stop looking at today's news. Look at what happened yesterday. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying, you know? When all is said and done, what do you believe will be the legacy of Lou Sims? Oh, man. I wish I wish I wish I can go back into the prisons and you know what I'm trying to say help those that need the help for us fight the uh the administrations from the prison abuse you know what I'm trying to say those that's been railroading their cases like I was railroading mine and not only that you know what I'm saying lead the youth to you know what I'm saying because like I said New York has become a bygone but it's not just New York we need to you know what I'm saying the gun violence is crazy because it's over nothing now you know what I'm trying to say but I would like to you, you know, get them a part of my story and let them know where they can go. Because like I said, today's day, you know what I'm saying, you got a lot of opportunities. But at the same time, if the politicians will allow us to come in and do for them, create jobs and, you know what I'm saying, back to the fundamentals of the free lunch and all this stuff and game rooms and all that stuff for them to have some place to go. All this wouldn't be, would be happening like it is. You know what I'm trying to say? So instead of you going over there and spending money on Ukraine, you know what I'm saying? Open up some some basketball centers, or you know what I'm saying? Give 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 some of the older older people in the you know money so we can throw tournaments or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Because we can't do it out of our own pockets. You know what I mean? Not you unless know? they want to get back in the street again. So right. So I'm basically saying if I want, if, 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 if as far as my legacy, as far as that goes, 
I would like to give back to that, you know what I'm saying? Especially the especially the prison and the youth that I don't even want them to even go that route no more because it got worse. You know what I'm saying? The food done got the food done went from you able to eat good and cooking food in front of you till it got worse. Now, you know what I'm saying? I'm on my commissary was just used for lockdown. Now commissary, you gotta eat that every day now because the food is is unedible in the in the in the mess hall. You know what I'm trying to say? Then in uh, commissary, the commissary got worse because, you know, you 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 either gonna catch sugar diabetes or you're gonna catch uh high blood pressure from the sodium that's that comes from the food. So, you know, so all this like I'm 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 trying to give them what what they need to know, you know what I'm saying, before they even even get there. You know what I'm saying? So you know what I'm saying? Don't don't bust your gun today, and then when you get to Ragged Island, you crying. You know, ain't nobody. You know, you know what I'm saying? You got a bunch of dudes ganging up on you for nothing. You can't use the phone to call. Don't don't nah. You know what I'm saying? You got another way. You know what I mean? You got another way. Speaking about the violence and the, uh, senseless shootings and shit like that, you know, there's been almost about forty mass shootings since the beginning of 2023. Yeah, I already what, know. What, what what are your thoughts on on that uh, on the mass shootings? Like I said, only I'm, I mean, the only way we can help our, our people is like I said, if if we get out there and, uh, and, and we can't we can't really help them. Like I said, the funds ain't there. You know what I'm saying? We can't get in places that we need to get in, like Rackers Island, so we can get back to those that's already there that's going to be released to come back. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Or we can't get in communities where we can hold a rally or have a a, 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 a concert where we're dealing with violence, you know what I'm trying to say? Or even create jobs or or centers that they can go to and just have fun. You know what I'm saying? We, we Right now, we don't have the funds for that. So therefore, we know, you know what I'm saying? We, we just, like my thoughts, if, if, if I can reach out and, 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 and touch one, even if I can save out of, out of three to... Out of the, out of ten, three three of use, I'm doing good. You know what I'm trying to say? But like I said, I can't do it by myself. You know what I'm saying? It ain't like I'm I got the funds to do it. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Well, we're gonna definitely do collectively everything between you yourself and, and Yui and you know unique um, and um, our brother OG Danny that's in the room with us here now. Um, you know, and all our brothers, you know, blackface, everybody, you know, everybody who's been through the thing and understands what the real impact of, of this whole situation is. You know, you said uh, humbly, if I could save two or three, you know, it yeah, you know, make a difference. But, only, the, but the two or three, put... look, if one person had saved you, yeah. look how many lives would have been impacted. Yeah. Right. You're right. But like I said, we can't only we can't only put it on the uh, politicians and all that too. You got you got you got celebrities and all the rest of them, whether it be basketball, music, or whatever that you know what I'm saying. Instead of just giving your money to charity, you know what I'm saying, give it back to the youth. You know what I'm saying, come back to the hood. You know what I'm saying. You know you grew up here, so you know who's in the hood. You know what I'm trying to say. How could you leave the hood and not come back and do what you you know what I'm saying and give back to the community that you not you know what I'm saying. Whether it's a free lunch program or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Don't come back one year and think you're gonna give out some turkeys and think that the neighborhood. Nah, man, this is a, this is a this is a daily thing that you gotta. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? With the the money that you spending, when you spending to eat, if it costs you fifteen hundred dollars, fifteen hundred dollars to two thousand dollars to fill your entourage, you know what I'm saying? One day, shit, that shit can go towards. You know what I'm saying? Help us rent the center for. You know what I'm saying? That's right. For a month. That's right. You know what I mean? That's a fact. You know so. We can't only blame the politicians. We got to blame a whole lot of others that's, that, you know, that's left and don't leave no number for no contact. I'm going to try to reach back. You know what I'm saying? I'm not asking y'all for nothing because I already see what it is. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm not asking y'all for nothing, but I am asking y'all to get back. So, you know, don't wrong me for my my attitude when I do when when, when, when I do see y'all. You know what I'm trying to say? When y'all get caught out of bounds, don't wrong me. You know what I'm saying? And that's not no threat. It's just what it is. I'm not asking, like I said, I don't ask y'all for nothing. But at the same time, y'all need to reach back, man. You know that's what I'm fact. saying? That's a fact, man. Accountability. Um, they build on our community. They rely on our community to give them validity for the larger community. Because if we don't accept them, then the larger community doesn't think they're authentic. They got no way of making the judgment about whether they true to what they you know, profess in their music and their imagery, except by the way we accept them. So if we don't accept them, and perpetuate the image, then the larger community doesn't accept them either. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of indebtedness that should be there for sure. 
Uh, tell us about the book project. I know that it was something that you've been working on in private, and I know you told me in private, but I'm blowing it up. Well, I got I got two books that I haven't published yet, but I still I got an IBM number, as well as uh, I got I got uh, the first book is Angel with Do- I mean three books, Angels with Dirty Faces. You know, it's is that a, autobiographical? No, nah, it's story? just a regular book. But my auto, the the uh, you know, me we already talked about that the the mm-hmm. about uh, the bio. So you know, we'll get to that later. You know, what I'm trying to say because you know we gotta really dig deep in that because that's a long history. That's go that that probably take like four or five books or series in a movie. Mm-hmm. You know, what I'm trying to say if you I tell deal it with thoroughly, the history, yeah. If I deal with the history from the street as well as the prison system, as you know, it's the over, whole overall. That should go. On, that's going to be a few books as far as my my, my autobiography, mm-hmm. as well as it don't you know, have to be a series. But like the books that I have written, they some good books because it it, it explains uh, uh, it goes into certain experiences, but it's, it explains like how we went from being innocent kids to. You know what I'm saying? Being getting our face dirty. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's part one of that book, and it deals with two characters, a female and a and a man and a uh, male point of view, a male uh, version of that joint. Where it's going, it's telling the story of the upbringing. You know what I'm saying? But um, part two is, is 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 a diary of a gangster. The diary of a gangster just speak on the male, on how he once he reached a certain level, how how Problems, regardless of how much money you get, problems is gonna come, come, come. But how he reached a certain level where he built an empire for his whole family to live off of before he got older, you know, even though the prison search since he did. But the last gonna come is uh is, is is called Prince. And it's about his this is about his man that got killed, son that grew up, that he thought he left the mother wealthy, but a police officer robbed her for the money and he grew up in poverty. And when he came home and he realized his, the son he was like, yo, that's the son. So, you know, it's it's, it's it's a good story. All three of the books, you know, all three of the books. But um, my my autobiography is called uh, 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 Judge by 12, Carry by 6. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's that because it's, it's dealing with mostly it goes to everything. But it, it starts off from the um, from when I got arrested from the death penalty and all the rest of that stuff. So it just goes in from the beginning, from the from the, from the the uh, childhood all the way up. You know what I'm saying? It goes through everything. And everything that everybody been anticipating and trying to know about is going to be in that joint. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what I mean? So that's what it is, you know? Excellent. Brother, I appreciate, you know, you blessing us and gracing us with your your presence and sharing your your pain with us you know and um i know that a lot of people if they pay close enough attention they'll take away some life-saving you know insight from this man um thank you for rocking with us lou you already know peace